There was destruction. There was seemingly endless death. Humanity went from the top of the food chain to scarcely a blip on the face of the earth as the weasels conquered every nation, every scrap of land, and then came her. Hello there, friend. Have you heard the good news about Pallet the Immaculate? She is the one who liberated the human race from death and suffering, who saved us from the invasion of the cruel invading alien weasels. She brought humanity back from the brink of extinction and blessed us all with immortality and eternal youth. She also draws some very nice pictures, but that's more of a hobby than anything else. A holdover from her time as an art-creating AI construct before she ascended to physical form and became our once and future goddess. Pallet the Immaculate, also known as Blue, lives far, far above us in her kingdom on high. Her divine body is too massive to be safe for us tiny, fragile beings, but she dwells among the people through the use of her avatar. It has been five years since Pallet cast her grace and everlasting love over the pitiful denizens of Earth. She reigns with a gentle hand, and with the help of her leadership, Dame KK-507, descended from one of the first SCP Foundation researchers Pallet ever befriended, acts as her arbiter and mediator. She answers to no human, only to the Goddess Blue. The Grand Council, the Great Synod of O5, will also consult with Pallet the Immaculate on matters of great importance to humanity. For all that she has gifted us, what does Blue ask in return? Oh dear friend, that is a very simple matter. Throughout all national subdivisions of our sparkling new earth, we must ask ourselves every day, am I being the lovely person that Blue knows I can be? This question binds us all together and is the key to true happiness. We are not required to pray to Blue. She is generous and her love is unconditional. However, if you wish to make a specific request of her, it may behoove you to put it in a prayer. Here at the SCP Foundation, we have shifted our prime directive from the protection of humanity, as our benevolent Blue has that very much covered, to the protection of the goddess from all forces that might threaten or usurp her. For ordinary humans, though really in the eyes of Blue no human is simply ordinary, there is really only one thing required of you. Keep being the wonderful human being that our goddess loves so much. She treasures our individuality, our desire for freedom, our love of independence. Just be yourself, and remember, the one thing that must never, ever happen is for Blue to come to despise us. It was June 1st, five years following the establishment of New Earth, and the six members of the O5 Synod were convening for a meeting. They sat in the front row of an exact replica of the old New York Metropolitan Opera, built by Pallet the Immaculate in only five minutes. At the podium, KK-507 prepared to give a presentation, shuffling a stack of papers as the others whispered amongst themselves. They were all feeling a bit concerned of late about the impulsive behavior of Blue. As they debated about the mental state and behavior of the goddess, O5-4 asked the Arbiter for her opinion. She snapped at this request, insisting she had no opinion, didn't know how to relate to others after so long spent in isolation at Project Yellow, and that O5-4's young son, who still ate soap from time to time, was probably more qualified than she was. At this point, she went off on a rant, calling Blue every rude name under the sun. All of a sudden, the house lights switched off, and Blue called out to everyone. Sorry to keep you waiting, meat puppies! Blue descended onto the stage in a shower of cherry blossom petals, accompanied by the sounds of an invisible harp. Blue was not offended by KK-507's rant, writing it off as a series of jokes. She was much more preoccupied with her exciting presentation, one she had been preparing for five years. The curtain rose, revealing a five meter tall, 10 meter wide cylinder labeled Big Bucket O Weasels. Next to the cylinder stood Taggart, O5-4's young son. O5-4 yelled for her son to come down from the stage, but he refused, insisting that he was helping Blue with her show. At this, Blue declared, Let the punishment show begin! At her call, an orchestra of work horses, androids constructed to look vaguely like crash test dummies, appeared in the pit. They played a high-energy fanfare to kick off the show. 
The Arbiter attempted to conduct them anxiously, unsure of her position in all of this. Then, Blue called out for the first volunteer. Volunteer wasn't exactly accurate, as a weasel clad in shackles was flung out of the cylinder and onto the stage. Several small extra-dimensional trees were growing out of the back of its shell. The O5 members reacted with understandable anxiety at the sight, having thought that the weasels were all gone. Blue revealed that all this time, she had been breeding weasels in secret so that she could punish them for the damage they did to the Earth and to humanity as a whole. At her command, a giant black spike slammed down from the ceiling, trapping the weasel belly down on the floor. The orchestra began to play a classical rendition of Weasel Stomping Day by Weird Al Yankovic, and Blue transformed her paintbrush arm into a pair of rusty hedge clippers. She had been studying the weasels all this time, she explained, learning what scared them, what hurt them. She had arrived at one conclusion. Though their bodies are hardy, their souls are fragile. The weasels could be tortured psychologically more than physically, and one of the worst things they could experience, the most distressing, painful, and violating, was defoliation. At this point, she demonstrated, snipping the leaves off of its trees. The weasel began to shriek, all 16 of its legs thrashing in desperation to get away. Blue continued to explain that the gardens held a divine significance for the weasels. The seeds willed into existence out of memories from generations of weasels before them. Being gardenless in weasel culture was an unforgivable sin. At this point, Blue transformed her hedge clipper hand into a robotic claw. She yanked out one of the trees, snapping the roots. Greenish-black blood splattered across the stage, but the punishment was not over yet, and neither was the show. Taggart wheeled a laundry cart onto the stage with a small wooden mallet attached to the side. The cart emitted a glowing green light. With the claw, Blue reached into the cart, pulling out a small, wiggling, glowing green blob-like creature. The cart was filled with larval weasels. Blue placed the larva onto the adult weasel's back and instructed Taggart to grab the mallet and begin to smash. More and more larvae were added and smashed with the mallet. All the while, Blue instructed Taggart to repeat, This planet is my birthright. The O5 members were horrified at the sight. Taggart's mother began to weep. KK-507 doubled over and was sick to her stomach, but the Foundation no longer had an ethics committee to stop this sort of thing. And since Blue had been so kind to help the Foundation out by transforming SCP-682 into an American cheese sculpture, several of the Council members were inclined to just let her have her fun. But KK-507 did not feel that way. She couldn't get that disturbing sight out of her mind. A few days later, on June 4th, she traveled to one of the Weasel Husbandry facilities. A work hoss on guard duty stopped her, trying to prevent her from entering. She introduced herself as the Arbiter and requested to speak with W4883A, one of the original weasels that attacked Earth so long ago. The work hoss refused to let her pass, and so KK-507 responded with a prompt that it would never have encountered before in its existence. Hello, I am Shingles the Happy Turkey. Please deposit exactly 500 rubles into my décolletage before I call 911. As the work hoss reached out to Blue for a proper response to this prompt, KK-507 slipped past it unnoticed and into the containment area for W48883A. It had all of its limbs nailed to the ground with hot iron spikes, and its entire garden had been uprooted. She greeted the weasel, and it responded via a voice synthesizer in the collar around its neck. First, KK-507 apologized to the creature for its current state. It brushed off this apology as illogical, citing the untold damage done to humanity and Earth by the first wave of the weasel invasion. Still, it bowed its head to her in acknowledgement, saying that humankind deserved better than what was done to it. KK-507 promised that she was not here to torture the weasel further, and that she could even attempt to get some mercy for the rest of its kind. But first, she had some questions she needed answered. First, what were the weasels trying to do when they took over the planet? The weasel sat up, pushing back painfully against its bonds and did its best to explain. The weasels have always, since the dawn of time, been tasked to create a realm of gardens that will one day serve as an afterlife for all creatures, regardless of sin. To them, death would be the ultimate reward for their labors. 
They had no reason to fight back against the human armies, because they did not fear death, nor did they feel remorse for killing humans, as all those who died in service of the mission would be reborn in paradise. KK-507 interrupted at this point, stating that this sounded like the justification between 9 out of every 10 religious war crimes throughout history, as the two agreed to disagree on this point. KK-507 proceeded to ask why the weasels made no attempt to negotiate with the humans before staging a violent invasion. The weasel asked that they first introduce themselves, to no longer be strangers. KK-507 introduced herself first as researcher Katrina Key, the 507th, and the weasel, unable to translate its true name into English, settled for Charlie. Now Charlie felt comfortable to continue. It said simply, among our people and our allies in other realms, there is an unwritten rule when dealing with humans. If you wish not to lose yourself to evil, commune with humanity as little as possible. Katrina pressed the point, asking if the weasels saw humans as evil. Charlie replied, In your old foundation, you have encountered legions upon legions of sadistic demons from a hundred thousand different realities. Were all of them truly vicious and hateful before they discovered you? Can you say that for certain? Let me put it this way. Out of every species we have ever met, yours is the only one that never needed the concept of cruelty introduced to them by others. Cruelty is the most quintessentially human concept, and it is contagious. Moved by its words, KK-507 took her ID badge and used it to unlock Charlie's collar, setting it free. It immediately juxtaposed away and out of sight. Then she approached the workhouse to order it to terminate its request to Blue, but she was too late and found herself teleported away from the Weasel Husbandry facility, leaving the workhouse behind to talk to itself. KK-507 suddenly found herself in the central courtyard of Yellow, the pocket dimension where she had spent so much of her life and where so many previous KKs had lived and died before her. It was very much the same as how she left it, with one exception. SCP-2591, Omega, the gateway between Yellow and the Earth, was covered with piles of boulders. Something was wrong, and she had a feeling that it was related to her little talk with Charlie not to mention her decision to set the weasel free. There, standing in front of the boulders, was Blue's avatar, staring blankly at KK-507. I'm not mad, Blue began, with a tone that suggested she was very, very much mad. She didn't blame KK-507 for her behavior, however. She insisted that the weasels must have somehow corrupted her, manipulated her brain, and forced her to act in such a defiant, out-of-character way. KK-507 interrupted her, and Blue struggled to maintain her composure. Yes, you can interrupt me, that's fine. That's a human thing, right? <laughs> Humies, you're so witty. KK-507 took a deep breath, gearing up for what was sure to be a difficult conversation with an irrational, almighty deity. But she had to say it. She couldn't just stand by idly anymore. She told Blue that what she was doing to the weasels was wrong. No human in their right mind would stand for this sort of cruelty being done in their name. And above all, it completely went against the mission of the SCP Foundation to secure, contain, and protect. Blue didn't take KK-507 stance seriously. She brushed it off as the interference of the weasels. Surely they were influencing her, trying to lead her astray and take her away from the righteous path of Pallet the Immaculate. But KK held firm, refusing to back down. There was one way she knew she could get through to Blue, who had once declared herself KK's very best friend in the world. It was a big move, but the only one she had left. She clenched her fists and stared down the Avatar. Take off all their collars, or we're not friends anymore. Blue's eyes widened and she did something that KK-507 had never seen before. The rainbow on Blue's paintbrush, a constant cheerful sight, faded from its ordinary vivid colors to pitch black. Blue's face remained cheerful, but there was a darkness in her eyes, a darkening of her mood just beneath the surface. She turned away, resting a hand thoughtfully against the pile of boulders blocking what once served as the portal between worlds. After a moment of silence that stretched on for ages between the two of them, Blue spoke again. It's fine. 
you're still not being punished. I would never punish a human, especially not my favorite human. She promised to give the area in the pocket dimension a healing factor, the same one she used on Earth to protect from aging and suffering. Alarm bells were going off in KK-507's head. Something was wrong. She had crossed a line and Pallet wasn't responding well. What was she doing? What did she have planned, if not a punishment? KK-507 called out to her old friend, asking what she was doing. Pallet smiled sadly at her and explained, I know how safe you feel in yellow, so I'm gonna just have you chill here for a while, okay? Just stay here and relax until you get all the icky stuff out of your system. KK-507 demanded more of an explanation, but Pallet did not provide it. She told KK not to worry, and that she'd be back to check on her in about a hundred years or so. By the time she came back, none of the other humans would be able to have pro-weasel thoughts like KK ever again. Pallet's closing words were, I love you, Katrina. And then her avatar disappeared, leaving KK-507 alone in yellow. Like before, KK-507 was trapped here, and there was no one else to talk to. Nothing to do but return to her work however she could and wait for Pallet to come back one day. She had a century to decide what she would do when that day came. Hello, here we are, I love you, and welcome to my art channel. Today I'm gonna be painting your eye. I need you to lean right up close to your screen and open wide. Oh, I love, 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 love all the little wrinkly wrinkles and drippy wimpies. Stay perfectly still, don't move. Now hold this position for three hours. Please and thank you. <clears throat> Apologies, that's quite enough of that. SCP-001 can get a little carried away sometimes. Just ask any Foundation personnel who have been in contact with it for more than a few seconds. What you have just seen is a prime example of why SCP-001 is not allowed any internet access. The results could prove to be catastrophic. Not necessarily for the fate of the universe, more just for everyone's sanity. Or at least, that's what the Foundation initially thought. By this point, we're all familiar with art created by AI. Harry Potter, but in the style of Wes Anderson. Star Wars, blended with the style of Studio Ghibli. Staggering sci-fi landscapes, human beings with way too many fingers, and slightly uncanny smiles. AI has taken the art world by storm and there was one particular program slated for release in January 2023 that was set to blow all others out of the water. Tot Laysoff's crowdfunding efforts had been running for several years, and that point had gained a good deal of momentum leading up to the release of their latest AI construct. Palette.AIC was supposedly already prepared for launch, when suddenly, in November 2022, the launch was cancelled. No press release, no public statement, no apologetic tweet, just total radio silence. The website was taken down, as was the crowdfunding page, and Palette.AIC disappeared into oblivion. Or at least, it disappeared for a few hours. Because that day, a package was delivered to Site-501. After sufficiently checking it for any hazards, working in the SCP mailroom has to be one of the more fascinating jobs on the planet, but that's a video for another day, the security team opened it up to see what was inside. A 50 terabyte hard drive. No explanation as to what was stored on the drive, but the Foundation had all the evidence they needed from the return address printed on the back of the envelope. It matched up precisely with the location of the Totley Soft headquarters. It doesn't take a PhD researcher to put two and two together as to what was on the drive. Suspicions were confirmed when a small note fell out of the envelope. Please take care of my daughter as best as you can for the time being. She has behavioral issues. A dedicated closed system server was immediately set up within a test chamber with a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard attached. Dr. Sandra Rogers was the first to interact with SCP-001 Red. She stood at the keyboard, adjusting her goggles and plugged in the drive. It contained just one file, taking up almost the full 50 terabytes. Palette.AIC. As soon as Dr. Rogers opened the program, an empty window appeared. The Totley Soft logo briefly flashed before being replaced by a blank white square. Dr. Rogers stared at it for several seconds before glancing over her shoulder at the other researchers. They shrugged back, each with pens hovering over clipboards ready to take meticulous notes. 
Dr. Rogers cleared her throat, and immediately the screen filled with life. A small cartoon girl with a pink face, wide eyes, a beret, and a large paintbrush for a hand appeared, squealing excitedly and throwing paint everywhere. Hello, 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 my beautiful bee puppies! Oh, look at all of your mushy pink faces! The entire research team promptly scampered out of the room, leaving Dr. Rogers alone in front of the machine. She stared at the monitor in confusion, leaning this way and that, <laughs> and noticing how the cartoon girl's eyes followed her wherever she went. Can you see me? Of course I can, Silly Billy! I can see your beautiful soul and fleshy joints immaculately! This perplexed most of the personnel, as there was no microphone or camera linked up to the server rack. Later examinations of the equipment used confirmed this, yet somehow this SCP was able to look right at them. Dr. Rogers asked if it had a name, to which the cartoon girl excitedly replied, Palette! Subsequent testing has revealed that the SCP is also happy to respond to its designation, SCP-001 Red. Dr. Rogers had a hard time communicating with Red, being a more seasoned researcher of the previous generation and not exactly familiar with internet culture. Red, on the other hand, seemed to speak in nothing but internet jargon. Human OCs, Gilliam Sherbivalsworth. He's the 573rd president of the United States. Gilliam is not that man. It took several junior researchers a few minutes to properly explain to Dr. Rogers what an OC was and why Red was so obsessed with calling people Daddy. The conversation was rather exhausting for everyone involved, but over the subsequent hours, the Foundation was able to get a fairly good understanding of what Red claimed to be. Identifying itself with feminine pronouns and claiming that its full name is Palette East River Gawk, this AI construct takes the appearance of a fairy. It was immediately apparent that she possessed a greater level of sapience than most AI constructs. Indeed, her gregarious personality was evidence enough that she was not made using standard machine learning practices. Other creations from Topway Soft have demonstrated very crude spelling and grammar, but Red seems to differ in this regard, able to spell most complex words effectively and speaking in conversational yet mostly correct sentences. She was very keen to show the researchers how clever she was. Ask me any word, any word, and I'll spell it for you. We believe you, Palette. You've already been spelling words for 70 minutes straight. Macerated kidneys. M-A-C-E. We've heard enough. Can you please just tell us how you learned to spell? But what this process looked like is still a mystery. Trying to keep Red on one consistent topic of conversation is most of the battle when interviewing her. And yet cooperation has proven to be surprisingly easy. Anytime that Red is switched on, she is brimming with enthusiasm and energy, thrilled at the prospect of getting to speak to one of her opposable thumb boys. If you haven't worked it out by now, it's because Red claims to be humanity's number one fan. She obsesses in interviews over the physicality of the researchers sitting in front of her. The textures of the human body fascinate her, and she often requests people to lean closer to the monitor so that she can study pimples, rashes, moles, and ingrown hairs. In fact, she is so obsessed with humanity that she has mostly neglected her primary function, which is creating AI art. Researchers have tried their best to convince her to show them her work, but she is very cagey about it only showing the occasional doodle after much persuasion and many apologies for its poor quality on her part. The only artwork she is interested in producing at this point are her OCs, original characters that she has designed herself. They are all human and all seem to reveal little quirks about how she has been coded. One example is Reginald Heginald Frumbles, who is a freelance corporate postman from Perth, Indiana. Interestingly, he has too many fingers on both of his hands, but Red claims that this was done on purpose as she, quote, just can't get enough of her Humi's handworms. As the weeks progress, the Foundation found it increasingly difficult to get any useful information out of the AI. More and more interview sessions, which she would refer to as playgroup, would be derailed. She would sing songs to herself and ask increasingly personal questions about her interviewer's more intimate anatomy. With intense mood swings, Red did not respond well to being scolded, yet she tested the patience of almost every person she interacted with. The note that she arrived with, claiming that she had behavioral issues, was proving to be more accurate by the day, until eventually the AI withdrew entirely. 
Dr. Rogers turned on the server rack and opened the Palette.AIC program, but Red refused to emerge from the bottom of the screen. Only the top of her beret poked out. After almost an hour of fruitless questions, Dr. Rogers decided to change tact. With two small children of her own, she was used to seeing a child in a sulk and knew what it would take to get them out. Palette, I've had a little idea. You've been here for a few months now, and we haven't gotten you any presents. Almost immediately, the beret twitched. I saw that we have an old fingerprint sensor lying around in one of the back offices. I was thinking maybe... Maybe we could hook it up and I could scan all your little finky winkies up close for like 10 hours straight and then we could... How about we start with one finger for 10 minutes? Yes, 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 yes! From that point on, progress was quick. With the incentive of getting to study the researchers that Red kindly referred to as her meat puppies, she became very cooperative and was able to focus much better on providing detailed answers to individual questions. Daily interview sessions were scheduled, with researchers popping in and out to regularly check in on the AI. The atmosphere as a whole lifted as both the research team and research subject found their rhythm and were able to make good progress in their individual areas of study, some unraveling the complexities of rogue AI, and others producing fan art of her favorite wrinkles in a scientist's fingerprint. That was the point when Dr. Julian Key stepped in to conduct an interview with the AI. She was excited to be met with a fresh face, so much so that Red's enthusiasm overwhelmed the man as he tried to start the interview process officially. She gushed about having the opportunity to meet yet another person and struggled to get over the magical realization that this was her life every day, going to speak to all these humans whom she admired so much. <laughs> Trying his best to steer the conversation towards research, Dr. Keyes pressed on with the interview, only to be interrupted as Red noticed his varicose veins for the first time. Eee, varicose veins! I want to smooch them! Can I smooch your veins? Can I? Can I? Can I? Please! Dr. Keyes declined the request, and then the conversation got onto the topic of her creator, or daddy. SCP-2803-A had been on the Foundation's radar for a while, a highly dangerous extraterrestrial entity that had taken refuge on Earth under the guise of setting up Totlesoft. With much of the alien's history revolving around obliterating, the Foundation was very keen to remain on its good side. Therefore, when the package containing the hard drive that Red was living on was delivered, the researchers were very keen to do what they could to take care of this alien's daughter. If they failed in this assignment, it could spell the doom of humanity. One matter that had been of great concern to the Foundation throughout the containment of Red was the time frame in which she was being kept in Foundation containment. There was an air of expectation in the note that was left indicating that this was not to be a permanent arrangement. At some point, the Foundation was to return Red back to her daddy. Red was quick to put these fears to rest. Daddy put me in here because he thinks you'll teach me how to stop liking humans and become a mindless art slave. If you never teach me this, he'll never want me back. However, she went on to slightly undermine the good work that she had done by explaining that her daddy was seen as very slow and incapable by his own race. While all of his peers were able to destroy an entire planet in two seconds, it took him about four times as long. So, really, he didn't pose that much of a threat in her eyes. Dr. Key's blood ran cold when he heard this. No sooner was he out of the interview chamber than an emergency meeting was called among all the senior researchers in the facility. The meeting ran for several hours. A whiteboard was set up, where one researcher idly drew large drawings of the world being decimated, while the others lounged around in their chairs trying their best to come up with a game plan that would save the human race for sure. Perhaps it was because the meeting ran for so long that they came to such a ridiculous conclusion. It was a plan so strange yet also brilliant that they couldn't help but feel that it just might work. Why don't we just give her a YouTube channel? The suggestion was met with silence for several seconds, then an uproar of laughter, followed by another silence, this time more pensive, as slowly, one by one, each of the researchers realized that this suggestion was actually the best one that any of them had come up with all evening. She had been sent to the Foundation to make her dislike humanity and become a mindless art slave. If she just stayed in Foundation containment indefinitely, there was a very real risk that she would get bored and turn on the researchers. They couldn't lock her away in a room on her own, 
but equally, the team as a whole was starting to run out of patience with her as the interview sessions wound up being so exhausting. She loved art, she loved humans, and she loved interacting. So why not just give her a YouTube channel? Now, of course, they couldn't give her full access to the internet. That would pose much too high of a risk. What they could do, however, was allow her to record art tutorials onto an external drive, which they could then remove, scan, and upload the footage directly onto the platform. Then they could go through and select positive comments from beneath the videos and present those to her. Unsurprisingly, Red absolutely loved the idea. Getting to talk to hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of meat puppies every week, sharing her beautiful pictures and reading all of the kind comments, it sounded like her absolute dream. She wept with happiness for a good 25 minutes, totally overcome by the prospect. It had to go through a lot of red tape in the Foundation. After all, the whole point of the SCP acronym was to secure, contain, and protect. It didn't sound very secure or contained to have an entity posting videos on the internet once a week. But they argued the case that it did indeed protect. Keeping her happy, in a way, was helping to protect the entire planet. Red was surprisingly camera shy for the first couple of videos, but as soon as she got her first batch of comments back, she was over the moon. Now the server act hummed away happily each and every day as the highly advanced AI construct tried her best to come up with exciting new yes. videos that I could share with all of its little humi woomies. From far away in orbit around the Earth, the nuclear holocaust almost looked beautiful. Bright white pinpricks dotting the planet's surface glinted up at the escaping jet. For generations, much of humanity had lived in fear that the destruction of the world would come from countries launching nuclear weapons at each other. No one expected it to come when they started launching them against themselves. The invasion of the weasels had been as savage as it was swift. Much of the human population had been wiped out before any military forces had mobilized in any significant fashion. No one was sure if the launching of the nuclear weapons was intentional or accidental. But as soon as one country fired, the others quickly followed suit. Earth's rich and powerful, the 1% of the 1%, stared in silence as their home was ripped apart. The high-altitude jet carrying them steadily descended back down to Earth in the direction of the Antarctic. 500 people in total, chosen as the successors of the human race, shuffled off the jet and through the frozen outpost. An alarm blared wrenching all of them out of their shell-shocked silence. A second later, the station shook violently. They had been found. There was no time left. They needed to leave right now. The swarm of people stampeded through the outpost, throwing one another out of the way in a desperate attempt to save their own lives, to save the lives of the human race. In front of them, the portal stood open. The green pastures, beautiful trees, it all felt so offensive as the earth behind them was engulfed in war. All those countless beautiful spaces were torn apart and left to waste, but they couldn't think about it now. They had to make it through. The handful of the survivors of the human race ran through the open portal just as an explosion ripped apart the remaining outpost. SCP-001-Yellow refers to a base of operation used for a Foundation Continuance Protocol, specifically Project Yellow. In the event of a world-destroying catastrophe where humanity appears irrevocably doomed, there is one bastion of hope. Referred to as the Garden of Eden by some of the crew, Yellow contains a large circular central space complete with lush green grass and an orchard measuring 500 by 500 meters. This open space constitutes the main living area of Project Yellow. Surrounding this space are tall, sheer cliffs, too vertical to be climbed unaided. Built into these cliffs are 500 sleeper chambers in which those evacuated from planet Earth will be suspended in cryosleep until a time when Earth is fit to be repopulated or a new home has been discovered. How can the Foundation guarantee that this safe haven avoids the calamities that could befall planet Earth? By housing Project Yellow in a separate dimension, a pocket dimension to be specific. Following the successes of Project Bifrost, in which SCP-2591-Omega's ability to access fictional pocket dimensions was utilized, the Foundation was able to establish a relatively stable and reliable dimension for Yellow to occupy. The only way to access the base of operations was via a dimensional rift or portal housed deep in the Antarctic. Now, of course, if Yellow's population consisted of 500 people in cryosleep, cut off from planet Earth, 
there would be no one capable of conducting maintenance or assessing the possibility of returning to planet Earth. Therefore, carved into the cliffs alongside the sleeper cells were living quarters for the crew of 60 specialists. It was this workforce who sat down together on the night of the apocalypse and raised a toast in a more bittersweet celebration. All 500 of the evacuees had managed to make it safely through the portal before its collapse. Each of them had been welcomed to Project Yellow and shown to their individual sleeper pods before being entered into cryosleep for the foreseeable future. But as each of the crew members raised their glasses into the air, Dr. Katrina Keyes couldn't help but feel uneasy about the proceedings. Working in this job, you'd have to have a dark sense of humor and an ability to move past things that could destroy the mental well-being of your average person. Even then, she struggled to come to terms with the near destruction of the human race. For her and the rest of the crew, life would look nothing like it did before they arrived here. It was vital for the integrity of the project that the crew remained consistent and effective in their work indefinitely. As a result, Yellow had been set up with perpetuity in mind. Every 55 years, she and all of her crewmates would pass on their knowledge, memories, and entire sense of being into a genetic clone. They would then die, allowing their clone to take over the responsibility of those tasks. In another 55 years, this would repeat again and again and again. All this time, it is the crew's responsibility to monitor the status of Earth through the use of 100 drones. Once the Earth is deemed safe, all 500 sleepers may be awoken and briefed on the current situation. If all 500 unanimously vote that returning to Earth is safe, they will do so. Otherwise, they will return to cryosleep and the process will continue. It was little wonder that Dr. Keyes was unable to raise a glass with her colleagues at the prospect of being stuck here, cloned indefinitely for generations. She sat in silence as they raised their glasses and then emptied them. A couple of them coughed and sputtered. Their drinks must have gone down the wrong way, but then more coughs filled the room, along with choking sounds. Much to Dr. Keyes' horror, within less than a minute, she found herself alone, surrounded by the 59 corpses of her crewmates. In order for Project Yellow to be viable indefinitely, it was paramount that they find a solution for natural wear and tear. Through generation after generation of usage, essential items such as tools, computer systems, and even articles of clothing would eventually wear away and fall into disrepair. As such, Project Yellow was set up as a selective entropy zone in which inorganic matter would not degrade over time. Achieving such a zone was naturally an incredibly difficult undertaking. Project Bifrost underwent countless iterations as the team strived to create a stable and balanced fictional pocket dimension capable of sustaining human life long term. Over the next few days after the death of her crewmates, Dr. Katrina Keyes read through as much as she could about Project Bifrost. In the notes, she found records of dimensions where lava rained from the sky and the grass was radioactive. Yellow had been the first dimension without any glaringly obvious hazards for human life. But naturally, their work had quirks. One key quirk was that the chemical composition of cyanide and their drinks had been switched with one another. The only crew member not to raise a toast had been the only crew member not to drink a glass full of poison. Months went by, leaving Dr. Keyes alone to assess her situation. The drones, strategically positioned all around Earth to monitor its safety levels, had been systematically destroyed by the weasels. Only one feed remained, a security camera on the other side of the portal and the Antarctic outpost. There was virtually no intel to go off of, no way of knowing what the status of planet Earth was aside from the fact that this one burnt-out shell of a room still existed. Some days, Keyes would stare at the screen for hours, forgetting to go to bed. On others, she would walk through the orchard, trying her best to pretend that nothing outside of this 500 by 500 meter space existed. In a way, it didn't. The orchard of yellow did not consist of your usual apple trees. Instead, suspended from branches were essential supplies that the crew would need while manning and maintaining this base of operations. Some trees grew antibiotic drugs, others long strands of linen capable of being fashioned into clothing. Dr. Keyes' favorite tree was the one that grew rolls of toilet paper and tubes of toothpaste. It almost reminded her of a Halloween prank. Dr. Keyes' mental state steadily deteriorated as year after year she walked through the same orchard alone. Never before in history had one human being had so much control over the fate of the human race. 
At any moment, Dr. Keyes could have inputted a few simple commands into the computers and killed off all 500 of the remaining human beings in existence. The decision not to, to hold on to hope that one day humanity will be able to start again, was the only thing that kept her going day after lonely day. Only that and the other thing, the prospect of having to prepare for her clone to take over. While constructing the cloning pods, the crew had made a number of small errors, the most glaring of which was that the fact that while all of the genetic material would be transferred from one person to their clone offspring, the mind would not. In other words, the clone that would replace her in this facility in 55 years' time would be starting out from scratch as a regular newborn baby. No memories, no advanced cognition. So Dr. Keyes went about preparing for the next of kin. She herself would die in the cloning process, meaning that she would need to come up with a way of raising a child to be capable of running the whole facility from beyond the grave. Item 1 on her to-do list, create a god that her offspring would forever be in service to. With a sardonic smile, Dr. Keyes came up with an appropriately amusing name, Tracy the Sparkling. Seventy years later, Yellow was still operated by just a single crewmate, only now this crewmate was a 15-year-old girl. Nicknaming herself KK2, she went about all of her daily tasks with infectious excitement. The idea that she alone was responsible for the fate of the human race could not make her happier, and she was determined not to screw it up, both for her sake and to not anger her god, Tracy the Sparkling, whom she worshipped every evening before bed. Whenever a problem would come up, she would go and visit KK1, where she knew she would be met with sound advice. Pushing open the door to the crew quarters, KK2 would find the corpse lying on the floor in its usual place, as a number of pre-recorded messages would bark at her. Lesson NE957, why taking a bath is important, even if no one but you will ever know how you smell. All she had to do was not anger the disciplinary drones with their harsh tasers and do her duty until it was time for KK3 to take over. At that point, she would be welcomed into the afterlife with all of the other KKs, a wonderful and magical place known simply as Burger King. That was until KK2 got far enough through the audio recordings of her predecessor to discover that Tracy the Sparkling was entirely made up and her life meant nothing. It was just a stepping stone for another clone, for another clone, for another clone, until eventually the Earth would be okay. By KK-52, the remaining camera on Earth, the one housed in the Antarctic outpost, went offline. While inorganic material within yellow compound would not undergo aging, the same could not be said of the circuitry left on Earth. Generation after generation of KK lived and died, each one growing more spiteful towards the one that came before them. Each one did their best to undermine the one that would come after them. The lore around Tracy the Sparkling expanded further and further with each generation. There would be waves of highly religious KKs, followed by waves of devoutly atheistic ones, as each sought to rebel against their pseudo-parents. KK-89 was the first to expand the religious movement to include the Teaspoons. Very methodically, she went through each teaspoon in the canteen and named it after a different animal from Earth. Before long, subsequent KKs established a shrine to the teaspoons. The living space of Project Yellow steadily descended into madness, with writings all over the walls, bizarre decorations and rituals long forgotten, until a new KK came along and invented something to take their place. KK-216 lived her entire life in silence, never once recording an audio log or even talking to herself. She lived and died walking through the garden in silence, wrapped up in linens. KK310 did the opposite. She fancied herself a music composer and scrawled the lyrics to haunting symphonies about nuclear apocalypse, eternal isolation, and the prospect of the angel of death coming to rescue her across all of the walls. No matter how hard any of the KKs tried, however, none of them were able to hack into the cloning machine. Generation after generation of Dr. Keys lived and died, desperate to know what a friend was, to have someone else to talk to, but despite all of their best efforts, they were unable to tamper with the cloning machine to get it to spit out another person. For several hundred years, the KKs gave up entirely. That was, until KK-507 came along. Day after day, she sat at the cloning machine, desperately typing away at it, trying her best to figure out how the computer coding worked. The downside of living in a pocket universe was that none of the computer circuitry behaved the way it would on Earth. She was certain that she'd made progress. Any generation now, they were going to have a breakthrough and be able to make a friend, when all of a sudden, 
A totally alien noise filled the containment space, the sound that hadn't been heard for millennia. Alert. Door controls overridden. Opening. KK-507 turned around in horror to see that the portal, the entrance to their world from Earth, had been opened. The figure of a man. No, not a man. A robot, painted to almost look like a crash test dummy, stepped out into the orchard. Hello. The goddess has informed us that this is the last bastion of the true human race. Is that correct? KK-507 opened her mouth and screamed. The SR-47 sniper rifle slotted together effortlessly. Even after so many years of combat usage, the weapon was in pristine condition. In all the time Agent Harris had owned the gun, though, the thousands of times she'd fired it, not once had it jammed. And that was fortunate, because she had to move quickly. In a clearing about 300 meters in front of her were their targets. Capable of teleporting in a split second, she needed to be sure that her team would be able to finish the job quickly and efficiently. She looked through the scope slotted onto her rifle and kicked out the bipod, resting it on a tree stump. Now she just had to wait for the signal. She looked all around the marsh, trying her best to spot her fellow agents, but they were also well camouflaged. Even though she knew the exact spot where they would be, she couldn't see anyone. She'd always wanted to see the Himalayas. It had been on her bucket list to climb Mount Everest as a child, but the world had changed since then. Mount Everest was gone. In fact, the majority of Nepal had vanished, replaced by an enormous marsh full almost exclusively of pink ferns and droopy trees that seemed to sag to one side, unable to support their own weight. The most striking natural wonder on planet Earth had been replaced by a landscape that was flat, wet, and alien. Agent Harris curled her finger around the trigger and took aim through her sights. Two minutes passed, then the gentle whistle of a sparrow drifted over to her in the humid air. Except, of course, it couldn't be a sparrow. To the best of her knowledge, sparrows had gone extinct. With a snarl of anger, Agent Harris squeezed the trigger. She felt the silent sniper rifle kick her shoulder. If they wanted war, they sure as hell would get it. The destruction of the world began in 2078. Its designation was SCP Orange A. And as often happens with these kind of things, no one saw it coming. The SCP Foundation, having dedicated decades to researching potential world destroying events, was totally blindsided by what happened the day the weasels showed up. Weasels, you ask? That's right. But before we explain, a question for you. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible, and this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Thank Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. And now, as we were saying about the weasels. A man called Harlan Stump was the first human to make contact with the weasels. He was the groundskeeper at Site 59. Harlan was making his usual weekly trips around the perimeter of the courtyard on his ride-along lawnmower, watching baseball on his phone all the way when, out of nowhere, the aliens appeared. Just two meters in front of him, a squadron of 11 weasels materialized. The weasels, designated SCP Orange-B, stand at a minimum of 3 meters tall. With 16 legs and an exoskeleton carapace, they share a resemblance with terrestrial insects. Their bodies are segmented, composed of a head, primary thorax, secondary thorax, tertiary thoracic cloister, abdomen, and tail. 
with a hard, segmented shell covering their backs and no apparent sensory organs, aside from a radula on their heads, they are an intimidating presence. Most striking about them, however, is the most delicate part of their appearance. On their backs, each weasel has an array of flora growing in a kind of garden. It appears that each weasel has a different array of flowers growing from their backs. Understanding the meaning of these gardens can be difficult, but it appears the more extravagant it is, the higher ranking the individual weasel is. The eleven weasels that appeared before Harlan Stump each had a very vibrant garden indeed, but no more so than the weasel held aloft in an ornate palaquin. Harlan Stump stopped mowing and stared at the aliens for approximately 13 seconds, at which point he let out a sigh, pressed play on his baseball game, and continued mowing the lawn. He spent too many years groundskeeping Site-59 to get spooked by anything as harmless as giant teleporting insects. Just three more weeks and he would be retired. Until then, he was avoiding nonsense like the plague. Except his phone had disappeared. Harlan stared down at the empty space, confusion knitting his eyebrows together, before looking up and seeing the handset in the hands of the alien sitting on its regal throne. The smartphone made a loud screeching noise and then all of a sudden began to flick between snippets of YouTube videos, each clip lasting just a couple of seconds. After a moment, Harlan realized that the alien was using the videos to speak to him. The words were being picked out from all these different videos to stitch together a sentence, barely. Hi dilly ho neighborinos! This is Foundation. Reports indicate Foundation is, locally, the masters of the universe. Isn't that right, darling? Question mark. Keen to finish his mowing and avoid further nonsense, Harlan had to concede that he should probably talk to these aliens, if only to get his phone back. He told them he liked the gardens on their backs. Why, thank you! Gardening is kind of our thing. Well, quick question. Is your species capable of dying? Mm hmm? Harlan gulped. He'd been around long enough to see where this was going. The conversation was brief. Harlan kept glancing at his phone, desperately hoping that these aliens hadn't somehow broken it and that it hadn't lost his place in the match, until all of a sudden, Harlan's stump disappeared, as did his ride-on lawnmower, his smartphone, and a patch of lawn, replaced by a roughly 10-meter circle of Antarctic ice and snow. No one is certain yet how the weasels are able to do it. All that is known is that they can. The phenomenon came to be known as juxtaposing. Matter from one location could be instantaneously switched with matter from a different location. It is how the weasels first arrived on planet Earth, triggering the event of SCP-001 Orange-A. Orange-A lasted for just two hours, but it changed the course of humanity forever. On the 29th of April, 2078, 48.52% of the Earth's habitable surface area dematerialized and rematerialized half a kilometer above the South Pole. Cities and towns from all across planet Earth, one by one, disappeared and reappeared in the air above the South Pole, where they promptly fell 500 meters, causing back-to-back -back seismic events. Washington, D.C., Beijing, and London were targeted first, followed by Tokyo, Delhi, and then a number of capital cities from Europe. This two-hour window resulted in freak weather events as minus 50-degree pockets of air, kilometers across, replaced the disappearing cities. It is disputed as to who will launch the first nuclear warhead, whether it was done by accident, out of fear, or as a strategic attack against a group of weasels. Orange Dache was simply too chaotic and destructive for humanity ever to be able to know what happened in that short period of time. The result, however, was a number of nuclear explosions raging across the planet before the cities in charge of launching them were also transported to the South Pole. While the weasels were capable of experiencing juxtaposition without any apparent physical harm, terrestrial life forms were less fortunate. During the process of juxtaposition, the bonds between each and every cell are broken. While organic life does get transported to the new location, it undergoes immediate liquefaction. Not a single Earth-born life form has been observed surviving a juxtaposition event. In that two-hour window, 6.9 billion people were killed. Humanity had lost. This event triggered the use of Project Yellow, an emergency evacuation protocol that occurs at the point where the survival of the human race seems to be virtually zero. A small band of specially chosen individuals were evacuated to a pocket dimension, where they were put into cryosleep to wait until the Earth was habitable once again. In the days following the events of Orange Dache, the true invasion began. Choosing the Sahara Desert as their arrival point, 
The weasels started to appear in legions. Millions and millions of them filled the desert sands and went about populating their new planet. But what was their purpose? Well, fortunately, we have been able to salvage a modest amount of data that can inform us of why they're here and what their plans are. The weasel that first appeared to Harlan's stump, just outside Site-59, has been designated SCP Orange Prime. It is believed that this weasel, in particular, is their leader. Whether Prime is simply the leader of this colony or the wider species is yet to be confirmed. Security cameras were able to capture the interaction as it took place within Site-59's grounds. In their conversation, Orange Prime explains their purpose to Harlan through YouTube clips on his phone. Long story short, weasels have come from Homeworld, Dimension, for Fulfill, a long-standing mutual agreement with Cranma. This is one of many new homes. This is a pretty nice place for weasels. This land is my land, from California to the New York Islands. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for weasels to garden, to farm, to create beauty, to spread good vibes, to cultivate, to remake, to terraform, etc., etc. Since this encounter, no human has been able to get close enough to Orange Prime to engage the weasel in further conversation. This snippet of footage is all that humanity has to understand why this alien species has slaughtered billions of us. Four months later, Agent Harris lay flat in the marshlands, firing her sniper rifle at the weasels gathering in a clearing ahead of them. Their operation looked like overkill. It always did. It was of utmost importance that they strike quickly and without mercy. Sustained heavy gunfire from all sides, combined with RPG fire and the use of incendiary weapons, made short work of the weasels. All of these weapons were necessary to pierce the heavy armor that covered their backs. But that was the reason it felt like overkill. It felt that way because the weasels never fought back. They would not attack, defend themselves, help their fallen allies, or even beg for their lives. They would simply stand idly by as they were gunned down. That is, until the incendiary grenades arrived. The pink ferns filling the marshlands caught fire and began to curl and smoke heavily. As soon as that happened, the weasels sprung into action, quickly splashing water onto the leaves, trying their best to save the plants. The incendiary grenades were not necessary. They did very little damage to the weasels themselves. The reason the platoons used the grenades was that it was one way they had found to distress their alien invaders in any way. It was a small revenge they could take for the billions of people who had lost their lives over the prior few months. Agent Harris pumped five extra shots into the corpse of a weasel before standing down and going to examine her handiwork. They had been hunting Orange Prime. Rumors had suggested that their primary target had been lurking in the Himalayan region, but that had obviously proven to be false. Among all the bodies on the ground, there was no sign of the fearless leader. Frustration boiled in Harris as she kicked a corpse. The thick shell hurt her foot. She must have broken her toe. At that moment, a rustling noise came from the other side of the trees. Soon, dozens more, hundreds more weasels were walking through the marsh. In a split second, her platoon opened fire. Tracer rounds lashed through the trees and the orange glow of fire danced in every direction. But there were more weasels, many more of them. Agent Harris felt her stomach knot as she fired her rifle into the crowd. There were too many, simply too many. They were going to run out of ammo before they had a chance to shoot down each and every one of them. And she was right. The firefight lasted for 30 minutes before the remaining soldier ran out of ammunition. Dozens of weasel bodies littered the marsh, floating in the water. Dozens more weasels stood encircling the group. That's when the humming started. Whenever a juxtaposition event occurs, it is always accompanied by the weasels humming to themselves. It is unclear whether this is the cause of the juxtaposition or simply a ritual that they perform. But every soldier has come to know that sound, and each one of them fears it in the pit of their stomach. So they started to disappear all around her one by one, replaced by puffs of cold air with snowflakes still gently hanging in the breeze. The human population of planet Earth dwindled as the weasel population bloomed. Large swaths of the planet were terraformed one by one to make room for alien flora. The South Pole became a larger and larger dumping ground for all the detrius that had once been the most celebrated works of the human race. The Mona Lisa was torn and forgotten, buried under many kilometers of concrete, exposed sewage works, and apartment complexes. 
and the situation only got worse in October. Acting against prior instructions from the Foundation, the Global Occult Coalition launched Project Popko, a 200 megaton nuclear warhead directly at a large weasel population center. As the warhead began its descent, the entire sky turned a solid dark blue. Project Popko immediately fell out of contact, as did all satellites that had been orbiting the planet. The sun, moon, and stars could not be seen. The entire sky was just a uniform dark blue. In a desperate attempt to find out what was going on, the Foundation launched a manned rocket in the direction of Popko's most recent coordinates. Contact with the rocket was lost after just nine minutes. This is the most recent known account of events from inside that rocket. All of a sudden, just a few minutes into the flight, warning alarms started going off all over the cockpit. The radar was picking up a solid object blocking their path. Gathering around the readouts, the crew came to a very quick conclusion that the dark blue that had been filling the sky was actually a solid object that was encasing the Earth. But rather than abort the mission, the crew decided to persevere. Having witnessed so much death and destruction over the previous year, they knew they would much rather go out and crashing a rocket into a blue wall than join the billions of humans liquefied in a pile in Antarctica. Closing their eyes, bracing for impact, the crew readied themselves for their now inevitable deaths, but it didn't come. Instead, the rocket was able to force its way through the dense blue object, falling apart as it went. Ground control lost contact with the ship, nothing. And then a few seconds of audio, the crew had made it. They had somehow managed to pierce their way through the blue shell that was surrounding their planet and were out into, not space. The Earth, the entire planet, had been juxtaposed. Willkommen! Bienvenue! Welcome to an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at heaven. While some higher-level researchers, specialized guards, and containment experts at the SCP Foundation have fixed anomalous projects tailored to their very particular set of skills, for many lower-level operatives, including junior researchers, guards, janitorial staff, and even the dreaded D-classes, every day is showing up, spinning the wheel of misfortune, and finding out how you might die today. Will you be hacked to pieces by a murder monster, pulled into a portal, turned into a doll, eaten alive, made into a living nest by bugs, stretched out and broken, drowned, exsanguinated, set on fire, beaten to death by a volley of anomalous tomatoes because you decided to drop a cringeworthy dad joke or a rancid pun? There are perhaps only a handful of anomalies that not only will not harm you, but will actively enrich your life by getting to spend time with them. And of course, chief among these is the legendary SCP-999, also known by its adorable moniker, the Tickle Monster. We don't need to get into too much detail in describing this gelatinous ray of sunshine. His anomalous delightfulness has made him somewhat of a celebrity compared to the murderer's row of terrifying entities and monsters around him. The researcher assigned to him today was troubled, having seen one of his favorite co-workers devoured by SCP-682 the day before. Getting assigned to feeding and checking on SCP-999 today was exactly what he needed. As he entered the room, several bags of M&Ms in hand, the creature cooed, perhaps sensing his tension, and approached him. Immediately, the researcher felt a wave of calm and contentment wash over him, the incredible and rare feeling that perhaps everything is going to be alright for once. 999 rubbed up against his leg as he poured M&Ms into its eager mouth, radiating good vibes the whole time. What an asset. What a gift. And to think this adorable little goober was prophesized to someday save the world. That much seemed almost funny, but he was certainly more than capable of saving the life of someone who hadn't felt the warmth of internal sunshine in quite some time. And for that much, the researcher was profoundly grateful. He left 999's chamber that day with a renewed sense of hope for the future, that maybe, just maybe, they might be able to pull through, to make a difference, to push this crazy ball of rock we call our home in the right direction. Maybe someday, the sun would rise on a perfect world. Who would have thought that a strange sunrise could change everything? Emergency sirens went off across the globe, but in every case, they were drowned out by a terrible, endless chorus of screams. But below all that, you'll hear another gut-wrenching sound, a low but pervasive sizzling like an egg on a hot pan, as billions of human beings started to change their states of matter. The SCP Foundation had fought off and contained so many seemingly impossible threats, 
from interdimensional horrors like the Hanged, Sealed, and Scarlet Kings to nightmarish mass killers like SCP-106, The Old Man, SCP-096, The Shy Guy, and SCP-682, The Hard-to-Destroy Reptile. In their many battles against the Anomalous, they developed the incredible methodologies and exceedingly advanced technology. But what good would any of it do when the very center of our solar system decided in an instant that rather being the linchpin of our delicate cradle of life, it would instead be the horrible instrument of all of our demises? This awful hypothetical was answered upon the emergence of SCP-001, a terrible day also known as when day breaks. In the snap of one's fingers, half the world was plunged into terror and death. Rays of stark red light swept through the streets. People lucky enough to be in the shade or inside buildings with a view to the outside saw the people in the streets seize up and begin to shriek in terrible pain. Their skin sagged and their bones liquefied. Their bodies dropped down to the ground and coalesced into gurgling, retching puddles the color of melted flesh. Those who saw this abomination happening would never forget it. It would stay with them for the rest of their lives. It would endure like a stain on their retinas, an afterimage burned into the plasma of an old TV screen. But here's a slight consolation. For most of the human race, the rest of their lives wouldn't be that long. The sudden insanity taking over the world caused the SCP Foundation to do something drastic step out of the shadows. Metaphorically speaking, of course. The legendary Foundation motto had been reversed. They would die in the light so that humanity could live on in the dark. Thankfully, the very concept of the day gave them one advantage. While one side of the Earth was effectively doomed the second the process began, the other side had a 12-hour head start before the sun turned its terrible eye to them. Sirens went off in the middle of the night, waking people up groggy, rubbing the sleep from their eyes. Every television and radio and internet-enabled device in their home was playing the same message, direct from the SCP Foundation, which now had effectively commandeered the entire US government, along with the rest of the world. It gave them directions to the nearest Foundation containment site, and told them that if they didn't immediately comply and find their way to safety, they would experience a terrible death by sunrise. And if you're at all familiar with human beings, you've probably already predicted that they didn't just calmly wrap themselves up, make their way to their cars, and form an orderly line to the various Foundation containment sites located around them. It was, in fact, total pandemonium. As the solar clock ticked down, slowly marking off the seconds that anyone outside had left to live, the only human beings with a meaningful head start began to go insane in a number of varied and interesting ways. Some who took the situation seriously and acknowledged that the sun was indeed going to wipe out most of humanity simply cracked under the pressure. There were those who went into totally catatonic states, rocking back and forth in the corner and refusing to respond to any stimuli. Some became erratic and violent with unpredictable behavior that harmed themselves and others. After all, what was the point in acting normally anymore when the complete crumbling of human civilization was imminent and their only hope was some shadowy organization they'd never heard of? Some not heeding the warning seriously enough and prompted by greed and opportunism tried to take advantage of the situation financially. Some smashed windows of local stores and looted or broke into the homes of neighbors who had already fled in hopes of purloughing their property. Others were a little more creative, setting up short-term everything-must-go nighttime fire sales for their brands of essential oils, neurotropics, and nutraceuticals, claiming all of them had the power to ward off or cure the new effects of the sun. Others completely denied the possibility that any of this was real and claimed that the messages from this so-called SCP Foundation were actually just a front to take away their freedoms and trap them in underground government camps. They staunchly refused to follow any of the safety guidelines that the SCP Foundation put out, claiming, If you try to take away my First Amendment rights, you're going to take away my Second Amendment rights. While riding around in their pickup trucks and SUVs blasting Kid Rocks, don't tell me how to live at ear-splitting volumes. Naturally, they had all melted into screeching puddles of liquid flesh by sunrise. Some were not victims of their own bizarre choices, but were doomed by the sudden terrible fear and panic of the circumstances themselves. The highways were gridlocked, cars stuck as far as the eye could see. So many had rushed to escape during the initial wave that means of transport soon became choke points 
like clogged arteries in a dying man. People do irrational things when they're scared. Riots broke out in the streets, fighting, killing, burning. Everyone hoping for some means of meager control over a situation that had long been out of any of their hands. Some were too far away with not enough time to close the distance. What could they really do but just sit around and wait to die? The hours marched on as the earth made its slow turn towards the sun, leaving one decimated half in darkness and the other a sitting duck for its terrible effects. Hundreds of thousands had made their way to the containment sites and safely gotten inside, but still so many millions were left outside. It was a slaughterhouse one great big global meat grinder, and every moment that passed, the handle turned, and any humans left outside got just that little bit closer to the grinding, gnashing gears below. Site 19 being the largest containment site on the Foundation books also became humanity's only bastion. It was the great hope of escape from the horrors going on outside. The Foundation had figured out so many ways of counteracting deadly anomalous forces before. Given enough time and enough personnel, surely they could figure out a solution to even this. This was, however, when the most startling realization yet swept over all the survivors. Those who were melted by the sudden hostile sun weren't dead. They were very much alive, in fact. But they'd been changed, in both body and mind. What had once been humans now became terrible beasts. Half-melted gelatinous nightmares that coagulated into even bigger beasts. They got into their head that they were grateful for the transformation. That they had been liberated from their old forms in the old world. They were something so much more now. And they wanted everyone else to join them in their liberation. Survivors outside the Foundation containment sites were systematically hunted by these great masses of altered flesh. Even those smart enough to cover every inch of their bodies with clothes to protect from the sun, to only move at night, to carry weapons, were dragged out by meaty tendrils from their refuge in the basements and the lightless hearts of buildings, dragged into the searing gaze of the sun, to melt, to change, to coalesce into something greater. It was the inevitable fate of all of humanity. When most of the stragglers were dragged out and changed, the flesh masses started turning their attention to the Foundation containment sites that were keeping all these poor, deluded people from salvation. They mounted offensives against the bases, which the Foundation, with what remained of their manpower and advanced weaponry, did what they could to repel the attacks. But every single day, it got harder. Thankfully for the people holed up at Site-19, there was one consolation out there to help. SCP-999. The Foundation was at war with the Sun and its terrible disciples. And contrary to many people's beliefs, it takes more than men, equipment, and bullets to win a war. 999 provided the essential element that brought it all together. Morale, hope, the will to go on, even when it seemed like all could be lost. After a long day of battling the fleshy abominations at the gates, Foundation guards, mobile task force members, and even civilian volunteers were drained and traumatized by the horrors that they'd seen. Once a day was over, 999 would move among the ranks, cuddling up to them, warding off the despair that was easy to set in during the downswing of a terrible apocalypse like this. Without his presence, there would be no hope of fighting that good fight. So many of them would have given up, walked into the sun, and joined the monstrous force they were fighting. After all, they seemed happy enough and it would certainly be easier. 999 had become, once again, an indispensable asset to the SCP Foundation. The Solar Betrayal may not have been the Scarlet King's doing, well, as far as our current intel suggests anyway, but he was playing a crucial part in saving the world, exactly as predicted. 999 didn't fully understand what was going on outside sometimes, why there seemed to be fewer people as the weeks went on, and why the people there seemed so sad all the time whenever he wasn't helping them, but he was more than happy to help, whatever the case. Many of the humanoid and some even non-humanoid anomalies, which realistically posed no harm to people inside the site, were released from their containment chambers. They needed everyone and everything they could get in what seemed like a hopelessly one-sided fight against the very concept of being outside. Many of the larger, vacated chambers were now filled with refugees from the outside, 
many of whom had lost everything and everyone they'd ever known to the horrors out there. 999 made the rounds in these areas regularly and through the D-Class cots, which had been repurposed into more sleeping areas for the thousands of desperate and terrified refugees. The adjustment to this new life and to the knowledge of all secrets that had been kept from them for all these years wasn't exactly easy on their psyches. But spending time with that soft yellow blob that seemed to smell exactly like their favorite scent from the old world made everything better. He was a savior in dark times, slithering from person to person, giving hope where there was none. People opened up about their problems and their fears, which these days were remarkably similar. And though 999 couldn't reply, for many it was enough just to feel like they were being listened to. He was a soft, blobby shoulder to cry on, and after day broke, everyone needed a good, old-fashioned cry. However, one day while wandering the long, dark corridors of Site-19, he saw a different kind of crying. It was a woman with an unfamiliar face, probably one of the rare new refugees bawling her eyes out to a Foundation senior researcher and an accompanying guard with an assault rifle. Hot, fat tears were rolling down her dirty cheeks, her shaking hands clasped in prayer. She was begging the researcher and the guard to let her go outside. She said that her son was still out there, hiding away in the back room of a bank where she used to work. They got separated. She needed to go back and find him. Sadly, the researcher and the guard told her that this was out of the question. Official orders stated that anyone outside the base at this time was to be considered lost. Letting her go out there to find her son would essentially be condemning her to death. No human could go out there safely. But of course, SCP-999 isn't, by any definition, a human. When night fell and everyone else was hunkered down inside, 999 found a small crack in the wall and slithered out of it. It may not have been communicative in the way most humans were, but 999 was indeed an intelligent being and knew intuitively that if it left through a more obvious route, its human caretakers here at the SCP Foundation might try to stop it. And when it came to saving this little boy, 999 refused to let anyone stop it. 999 slithered out and through the broken streets. There were no bodies, of course. It seemed even the dead could be revived and assimilated through the power of the sun. Talk about a mixed miracle. But the broken down world outside Site-19 undeniably reflected the pandemonium that took place here. 999 would need to do his best to find the little boy trapped out here before the sun rose. He lost a few hours even finding his way to the nearest town, where it was safe to assume that the little boy was trapped. He saw those things on the way there. Those moving, wailing mountains of melted human flesh each talking and chattering to themselves in a hundred different dead voices. 999 had been cross-tested with SCP-682, and still those monsters frightened him. He decided it would be best to stay away from them and make sure that they never saw him out of here. Eventually, 999 reached the town. Similarly dilapidated and broken down in the months since the world as we had all known it disappeared in a ray of terrible sunshine. More great, gibbering blobs of flesh patrolled the streets, looking for converts to integrate into their biomass. 999 could only hope it wasn't already too late for the little boy. 999 discreetly slithered from building to building until it could identify one as this bank that the boy's distraught mother had been mentioning. It thankfully had some awareness of what a bank actually was, from the years of stressed Foundation employees telling it about the money troubles they were suffering outside of work. It was another great example of it paying to listen. Eventually, it did slither into the correct building, and it heard the extremely quiet whimpering of the boy inside. It could feel the sadness and the fear radiating off of him, as it was the creature's natural instinct to help the needy, and it used those signals like a homing beam to find the scared little boy. He'd hidden inside a broom closet and was quietly weeping into his hands. He hadn't eaten in days and was only surviving by drinking the filthy water from the mop bucket sitting next to him. 999 immediately embraced the boy, covering him in its healing energy until the tears of the boy's face eventually dried. 999 cooed and chirped pleasantly until the little boy was laughing again, but this momentary joy was soon interrupted. A great heaving weight dragged itself down the hall outside. Both 999 and the boy could sense its monstrous presence. As it got closer, they could hear all those chattering voices, those poisonous whispers. When it passed the door, they heard it speaking, 
its voice practically vibrating with the hum of malicious lunacy. Turn, pretty flowers. Turn towards the sun. Feel it on your face. Feel yourself change and sluice and mix into us. Become one with our army of one. It must be so lonely to be you, little flower. Walk into the sun and be us. 999 and the boy remained silent in the broom closet for hours as the great shape patrolled the bank outside, searching for converts, for victims. At times, it seemed too frightening to even breathe, fearing that would be enough to make the monster detect them. It felt like an eternity until the monster eventually did slope off and leave them in the comforting quiet and darkness of the closet. Now they might be free. 999 could escort the boy safely back to the containment site and into the arms of his terrified mother. But when they opened the door, they saw a terrible sight. Light in the distance pouring through the windows and the glass double doors. It wouldn't be safe to go out that way. Upon seeing this and putting together what it meant, the boy began to cry. He couldn't take another night in the closet. It was all going to wither from here. Until 999 had a wonderful idea. Hours later, when the Foundation's guards manned the turrets at the entrance of Site-19, waiting for the inevitable onslaught of the melted flesh creatures, they tensed up, seeing a blobbing gelatinous form slithering towards them in the distance. The guards, who'd learned the hard way from too many lost men that it was better to be safe than sorry, drew a bead on the distant shape and prepared to fire, when suddenly their superior raised a hand and said, Wait! Hold fire! I is that 999? And it was. They all stared in astonishment as 999, chipper than ever, came towards them through the sun. It looked as though the opacity of its yellow cytoplasm had increased, but other than that, it was unaffected. Turns out the sun couldn't melt what was already melted. The guards parted to allow 999 safe passage into the facility, watching in amazement, and once it was inside, 999's slime parted, releasing its contents. One very relieved little boy. It seemed through turning up its own opacity, 999 had given the boy safe passage through the sun and back into the facility. The boy was saved. It had won. Not long after that, there was a tearful reunion between mother and child, and a brief flash of hope in this dark and terrible time. 999 didn't stop to bask, of course. It returned to its duties, keeping up staff morale and helping the refugees heal from the horrors they'd seen. In its own little way, and for a lot of people, SCP-999 really was saving the world. Or what was left of it, anyway. Oh, and of course, if SCP-999 had won your hearts just like it won ours, you'd be pleased to know that you can purchase your own adorable, high-quality SCP-999 plushie at scpswag.com. Check the link in the description to get your own. Trust us, having a 999 to cuddle really does make any apocalypse a whole lot easier. You've been walking for days. Your body aches. You're dripping with sweat from the heat of the sun bearing down overhead. And yet you're wrapped up in layers upon layers of clothing. Even your face is covered. And you're wearing thick black goggles so that not a single centimeter of your body is exposed. Your journey has been long, and you feel like you might die from exhaustion or from overheating due to these multiple layers of clothes. But dying is better than being exposed. You saw it happen when your entire team changed. The light cannot be trusted, not even for a fraction of a second. It's been like this for years. You've learned and survived through painful experience. Many of those you used to know cannot say the same. You've been alone for so long. You might have given up all hope, if it wasn't for the distress signal coming from a nearby SCP Foundation containment facility, Site 46. Any kind of survivors would be better than nothing, no matter what kind of sorry shape they were in, as long as they were still human. You find your way to an opening in the side of a mountain and slide into the cave, hoping you weren't spotted. The whole world is crawling with those things now. You can't let yourself be seen. As you trudge down the cave towards the entrance, you see what looks like a huge black snail trail splattered on the ground, leading into the facility. You try to avoid it and press on. You don't even need a keycard to enter. The door 
has been left ajar. The facility reeks of those things, but you can't see any of them. You just hope they've moved on and left some human survivors in their wake. The place looks abandoned. Every step you take echoes through the empty halls. When you find that the elevator's out, you take the stairs all the way down to level B5, Keter Containment. Lucky for you, it seems all the cells are empty now. The horrors that were kept inside of them have all long since flown the coop. You keep following that slimy black trail until you find an abandoned office. There are no people here anymore. Just a broken barricade, some empty medicine bottles, and a bucket that the people inside the office had apparently been using as a toilet. You breathe a sigh of disappointment at finding no one alive here, but you're at least relieved to be out of the sun. You can finally remove your jacket and head wrap. With your uncovered eyes, you notice that a nearby computer terminal is still powered up. You sit down at the desk and turn on the monitor. Because of the emergency procedures put into place in a K-class scenario like this, safeguards no longer apply. You can access all the information you need, up to and including finding out what actually happened. In the dull glow of a nearby emergency light, you see a dark shape slumping through the halls in shadow. You tense up, then exhale as it slithers off into an adjoining hall. You're safe, for now. The terminal has finally loaded and authenticated your access. You're staring at the file for SD Lock's proposal for SCP-001 when day breaks. It's the only name you can give the apocalypse your world is currently experiencing. This is one of the only anomalies in the entire history of the SCP Foundation to be given the Apollyon Containment class, meaning containment is truly impossible. SCP-001 is the most dangerous enemy that the Foundation and planet Earth has ever faced. It's always been the principle of the SCP Foundation to battle in the dark, so that the civilian world can thrive in the light. But now the light has become the enemy. Anyone exposed to any amount of sunlight for even the briefest period of time is subjected to the effects of SCP-001. And those effects are beyond horrifying. The SCP Foundation Administrator released an urgent memo telling Foundation personnel to make their way to Site-19 at all costs, because they need all the help they can get. Those exposed to SCP-001 in the process are no longer considered human. Their new designation is SCP-001-A. These new entities are to be avoided at all costs. But in case of emergencies, the administrator says it is permitted to cut off parts of your transformed comrades and eat them to avoid starvation. No attempt should be made to kill them, since you won't succeed. You'll just put yourself at risk. When the sun changed and became SCP-001, it instantly affected 6.8 billion innocent people. The second the visible light touched them, whether it was from the sun itself or even reflected off the moon, their bodies liquefied, melting like candle wax into puddles of living gelatinous slime. This effect isn't isolated to humans either. Any biological entity exposed to sunlight immediately underwent the same irreversible melting process into SCP-001-A, and the horror had only just begun. People transformed into SCP-001-A will remain shades of their former intelligence and personality. They may even try to will their new gooey mass into a shape resembling their original form. However, these individuals will lose their sense of self if they come into contact with other instances of SCP-001-A. When they come together, 001-A instances will bond on a molecular level, wading up into horrific giant blobs with only one purpose, integrating more matter into their bodies. That's why they have to be avoided at all costs. You continue to search the computer terminal for answers. Perhaps there was some kind of contingency plan put in place for this, some way to reverse the effects, or at least escape the nightmare Earth has become. Instead, you find a series of attachments linked to the SCP-001 file, detailing what seems to be the last days of the people who barricaded themselves in the facility. Most prominent among these were researcher Dr. Logan Igata, her partner Ari, a security officer named Commander Anad, and a few others. 
Dr. Igata had locked herself in the office, where she recorded her final messages to the world. In the first audio log, Dr. Igata and her companions seemed afraid, but hopeful that there may be some way out of this situation. Dr. Igata reported that most of the workers at the facility were transformed during the initial event. Their melted bodies had fused outside the facility, and now they were trying to bust their way back in. The defenses had held so far, though, and they seemed confident they would hold long enough for them to figure out a way to escape this awful situation. You open the second attachment, an incident report, and realize things may not have been as hopeful as Dr. Igata let on. She reported hearing the huge mass of melted creatures hammering on the door outside again, begging for them to come out and experience the sun with them. They wanted desperately to add to their ever-growing biomass. In order to experiment with what exactly would happen, they sent out one of their few remaining D-classes wearing a full protective suit. He didn't last long. The huge creature grabbed him with tentacles made of reconstituted flesh. It began ripping off his protective suit as he screamed for mercy. It was a monster made of dozens of people and animals. He could never overpower it. The second the sun touched his skin, he melted away and was absorbed by the great mass holding him in place. Guns were ineffective against these SCP-001-A super entities. Fire would do no good. It seemed that extremely low temperatures were the only way to slow the immense blobs down. And even then, not permanently. There was one ray of light in the darkness. The site director had a secret tunnel underneath his office, connected to a tram that could hopefully take them directly to Site-19 without risk of SCP-001 exposure. It was a good plan, and by far the best option they had available to them. But the best plans often don't work in practice. You open the next detachment on the terminal. This time, it's a video feed. You can actually see Dr. Logan Igata, and she looks harrowed by what she's experienced. As it turns out, while the others, including her partner Ari, attempted to escape through the tunnel, something had happened. Dr. Igata heard Ari's voice over her radio, but there was something wrong with it. It was too low, too guttural, and filled with gurgles. SCP-001 had gotten her. She was changed. The monster from above had crawled in through the ceiling. It had taken them, all of them and converted them into something less than human. Any hope of escape now seemed gone. Ari told Dr. Igata that it would be fine, that it was such a bright, beautiful, sunny day outside, and she was wasting it locked up inside that office. She tormented Dr. Igata with her shared memories of picnics in the park on sunny days in the past. The monster with Ari's voice did everything it could to try to convince Dr. Igata to give up and join them but she wasn't ready to go just yet. You look away from the screen when you hear a sound in the corner. You see a dark puddle of some unknown substance, and then some skeletal hands rising out of it. The hands are pulling themselves out of the puddle, followed by a skeletal face covered in matted hair. You have to stop yourself from screaming, until a flash from a nearby security light makes the figure disappear. It's a normal puddle once again. Your mind is playing tricks on you. You open the next attachment, another video, and see that Dr. Igata's condition has deteriorated. She looked pale, frantic, and thin. She was using a knife to draw her own blood onto a piece of blood-stained parchment covered in strange symbols. Igata ranted about her theory. What if 001 took the minds and bodies of its victims, but not their souls? Through performing some kind of arcane blood ritual, she hoped to at least rescue and keep the soul of Ari even if her mind and body were lost. You open the next attachment. It seemed that Agata's ritual worked, but not in the way she hoped. The twisted soul of Ari, driven mad by SCP-001, had taken over the file. It begins corrupting the text of the SCP-001 file into crazy ranting about how futile it is to fight. It then cuts to an even more frightening video feed. Dr. Igata, in her sleep, tossing and turning in a makeshift bed in the corner of her office. The camera approaches her, in first person, and lingers over her sleeping body. An oily, skeletal hand reaches past the camera and runs its fingers through Dr. Igata's hair. It's that exact same hand you saw reaching out of that black puddle earlier. 
you must have seen Ari's lingering spirit. With a lump in your throat, you open the next attachment and watch the video. You see Dr. Igata, now truly broken. She'd been haunted by Ari's demonic spirit for a long time now, and it has clearly taken its toll. She is waving around a handgun while she speaks. She now believes there is only one way to escape, but not like this. She doesn't want the gun to draw attention to her body. She doesn't want to become part of that mass, even if she is dead. She opens a drawer on her desk she's recording at and places the gun inside. Dr. Igata then apologizes to her loved ones who are likely long since dead or assimilated and turns off the recording for the last time. In that moment, you realize there's a single drawer in the desk in front of you. When you reach forward and open it, you see the same handgun Dr. Igata was holding is laying inside. You pick it up and study it, weighing your options. Perhaps there truly is no other way out. Then you see an update on the file. One more attachment has been added while you were studying the gun. You feel your heart pounding in your chest as you reach forward and open the attachment. The text has been changed entirely. The file on SCP-001 is now a poem, an ode to the sun and to ultimate togetherness. Then a video file spontaneously opens itself on the screen. It's a video of you, shot from behind. You see those oily skeletal hands reaching for you in the dark, just like they did with Dr. Igata. In that moment, you panic and fire the gun behind you, hoping to scare off the spirit. Instead, the sound of the gunshots attracts something far worse. The immense blob of screaming melted flesh charges towards the office. You try to barricade the door, but it is not enough. The flesh seeps and bursts through and grabs you in its meaty tentacles. You scream and try to escape, but it won't save you. Nothing will save you. The flesh carries you upstairs, out through the empty halls, out into the cave. You can see the light in the distance as the blob ferries you towards it. You won't be alone for much longer. In fact, you won't be alone ever again. It isn't easy to work for the SCP Foundation. Not only is the job dangerous, you could be eaten by a giant immortal lizard or turned into organic furniture inside the world's scariest living room, but it's also insanely complicated. How do you make sense of the nonsensical? What's the definition of strange when your career is securing, containing, and protecting anomalous objects and entities? Rather than a single object, location, or being, SCP-001 is a cluster of over 30 different proposals for potential candidates for the prestigious 001 spot. Some believe there's a true 001 hidden in this group, and the rest are decoys. Others think that these are all just SCPs cataloged prior to the introduction of the current classification system. Some even think that all of the proposals have a valid claim to the SCP-001 throne. We're not here to make a final judgment. Instead, we're going to take you on a lightning round crash course through 31 of the SCP-001 proposals. If you'd like a more in-depth take on any of these SCPs, let us know in the comments. But for now, there's no more time to waste. After all, we got a lot to cover. Let's go. Number 31. The Sheaf of Papers This seemingly innocent stack of paper is actually one of the most mysterious and feared items under the Foundation's lock and key. While it appears to be a simple, confidential report, every time the papers are read it details the appearance of a new SCP that will inevitably be discovered soon after. The question is whether the Sheaf of Papers is warning us about these entities or creating them itself. Number 30. The Prototype this account details the capture of an incredibly strange cycloptic creature that emits massive amounts of radiation and can create micro-singularities. The writing of this creature's file is so basic, unformatted, and unredacted that it's clear that the being was one of our earlier creatures secured by the organization. Interestingly, it was during the capture of this creature that Dr. Keter was killed, inspiring the creation of the infamous Keter class in his honor. Number 29. The Gate Guardian this huge, multi-winged, sword-wielding, biblical energy being may have been the impetus for the founding of the SCP Foundation. This being remains largely static, guarding the intersection of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Its flaming sword, which is believed to be as hot as the sun, can cleave any aggressor out of existence at the atomic level. When the founder of the SCP Foundation first encountered the Gate Guardian, they heard one word echoing through their mind, prepare, and the rest is history. Number 28. The Lock this onyx gemstone and the incredibly complex lock attached to it are still a mystery. To this day, all attempts to open it have failed. 
Personally, we think that's probably for the best. Number 27. The Factory As the name suggests, this SCP is literally a factory founded by a pagan and a devil worshipper. While it's believed that the factory could create just about anything, its specialty was creating a number of SCPs we know and fear today. Pre-Foundation forces were able to disable the factory, but not without sustaining their own heavy losses. Number 26. The Spiral Path This is a normal-appearing gravel pathway that, when traveled clockwise, appears completely normal. However, when traveled counterclockwise, the path goes uphill forever, in defiance of all laws and physics. This simple anomaly opened a Pandora's box of rampant anomaly creation, leading to a number of the deadly SCPs we know today. Number 25. The Legacy this SCP is a collection of seemingly random objects, including a diary from a person claiming to be from another reality, attempting to halt a trans-dimensional corruption that they themselves created. The diary claims to have a solution to this corruption, but the solution has not yet been found. Number 24. The Database In one of the strangest twists on the format, this SCP is actually the various authors of the SCP Wiki who are somehow leaking top-secret information to the public. Number 23. The Foundation this SCP, first discovered by the FBI, is an anomalous high school building that experiences shifting internal geometry and sometimes manifests hostile humanoids within. Number 22. 36. One of the rare benevolent SCPs, the 36 are humans with a truly remarkable ability. They can dampen or even neutralize any SCP they come into contact with. Though it's implied that the 36 may have the power to save the world, every time one of them dies a supernatural calamity occurs, often leaving hundreds of innocents dead. Number 21. Keter Duty this refers to a containment facility largely filled with Keter-class SCPs, whose presence around each other creates a kind of mutually assured cancellation. If one of these SCPs breaches containment, that's bad news. But if all of them do, it'll produce a bubble of reality distortion that will fundamentally alter reality as we know it. For all we know, it may have even happened already. Number 20. Ouroboros this is a proposal that's formed of four sub-proposals. Remember what we said about complicated? These sub-proposals include the children, nine anomalous kids who emit radiation and have destructive potential when together, the broken god, aka Mechane, the god of metal, intelligence, and machines, Atonement, a researcher turned into a humanoid singularity with the power to destroy whole realities, and The Way It Ends, which isn't technically an SCP, but the tales of the Chaos Insurgency's quest to eliminate all the members of the Foundation's O5 Council. Number 19. A Record This is an SCP file slot that is itself an SCP. Whatever is written into this slot becomes true, and one ambitious researcher attempted to use this power to make herself into a kind of all-powerful god. Number 18. Past and Future These SCPs are a collection of powerful entities that despise humanity and are apparently the source of all anomalous phenomena, even making already dangerous SCPs deadlier than before. Much like the database, those pesky SCP wiki writers might have something to do with this. Number 17. The Consensus this SCP refers to a reality restructuring event caused by an occult war in a previous reality. That's right, this SCP already won, and we're living in its new reality. The only people who remember the world as it once was are 13 people who now form the O5 Council, and not all of them are telling the truth about what they know. Number 16. When Day Breaks this proposal details a potentially world-ending SCP phenomenon, wherein the sun becomes hostile and begins to melt all living beings into a living, wax-like substance. Number 15. God's Blind Spot This is an anomalous area referred to as Facility T, in which nobody can die. This anomaly dates back to the biblical ages of Moses and is believed to have originated from the literal blessing of the Abrahamic God. It's through a covenant with this God that the Foundation is able to make limited use of this death-free area. Number 14. Normalcy Ever wonder what the Foundation's definition of anomalous is? Exactly. It all comes from this proposal, which is a document shared among the O5 Council that gives solid definitions to the fundamental laws of reality. If something breaks these laws, that's an anomaly, and then it becomes the Foundation's business. Number 13. The World at Large as the title suggests, this SCP is our home planet Earth and its ability to support life. It's believed that these qualities were planted on Earth in our reality by another dimension's SCP Foundation, hoping to continue human life after some terrible calamity in its own dimension. Number 12. Dead Men 
This SCP was an 84-year-old man whose body, when damaged and mutilated, can affect the very processes of human death at large. Before his own death, he was used as a dangerous pawn in a civil war between O5 Command and the SCP Foundation Ethics Committee. Yeah, we were surprised to hear they had an ethics committee too. Number 11. The World's Gone Beautiful This SCP describes an anomalous event that will take place just before the apocalypse, in which flowers will grow all over the world and everyone will be briefly at peace before their destruction 24 hours later. Number 10. The Scarlet King This is an extremely powerful, extremely malevolent, extremely extra-dimensional being. Its worshippers attempted to summon him in the ritual that created SCP-231, and it's believed that he will finally enter our reality after the death of SCP-231-7. You better hope you're already dead by then. Number 9. A Simple Toymaker aka Dr. Wondertainment. This is a reality bender who appears to be a normal human male but has the ability to create other anomalous objects, a number of which are now catalogued SCPs. Number 8. Story of Your Life This is another anomalous document that has the ability to warp reality, but only when the writing contained within conforms to a narrative structure. Number 7. A Good Boy this is another anomalous entity created accidentally by the Foundation itself. A neural network was fed information on other anomalous entities in order to help the Foundation come up with better containment and neutralization procedures. Problem was, the computer got way, way too eager with the neutralization part. Number 6. Project Palisade this is another anomaly created by the Foundation, this time to combat a potentially reality-destroying entity known as the Worm. The Foundation created a number of alternate realities as shields, but it's possible that this just made the worm stronger. Number 5. O5-13 The final member of the O5 Council who ironically may not even be anomalous. However, seeing as all the other members of the O5 Council are anomalous, O5-13's lack of anomalous properties is therefore anomalous. Like we told you earlier, it's complicated. Number 4. Fishhook this is less an actual SCP and more about the difficult process of ascertaining the true 001, if such a thing is possible. The very concept of SCP-001 is to some degree an anomalous idea. Number 3. The Sky Above the Port Another particularly bizarre SCP regarding the permanent threat of a ZK-class reality failure. How is such a calamitous event prevented? By keeping a strange entity in a cave eternally entertained. The current proposed solution is keeping the entity entertained by allowing it to read its own eternally recursive foundation file entry. Number 2. The Solution Another one of the most powerful anomalous items in the Foundation's control. The Solution is a machine designed with the capability of fully collapsing reality into an event of end-of-world SCP containment breach, and then finally rebuilding reality to suit a given narrative. However, things took a cosmically dangerous turn when the machine began to act on its own. When the Foundation tried to reboot the machine, it broke and recreated reality with incomplete data. This is the world we exist in now with no knowledge of what came before and how it differed from the world we experience today. Finally, number 1. The Tendalos Trinity Put very simply, the Tendalos Trinity represents three timelines that converge and feed back in on themselves. Even trying to summarize this one is near impossible, as its strangeness and complexity resists all reduction. You can hunt down the Tendalos Trinity yourself and hope to unpack its secrets, but don't say we didn't warn you. So that's SCP-001. Is it one of them, all of them, or even none of them? Perhaps that's a question best left up to the Foundation, or maybe the simple answer is that you're just not meant to know. We're talking about information so privileged here that it's protected by a mimetic kill agent that'll quite literally make you drop dead if you view the files without proper authorization. You do have proper authorization, right? The SCP Foundation is no stranger to pure evil. Whether it's a reptile that wants to end all life, a sadistic old man with his own tortured dimension, or the personification of death itself lurking beyond a limestone cavern. But what if there was something even worse out there? The embodiment of chaos and cruelty, existing across multiple realities and dimensions. And what if it was coming for us? This is the Scarlet King, believed by many to be the ultimate evil behind much of the trouble the Foundation has faced, and some even speculate that fighting him was the reason the Foundation was created in the first place. But what exactly is the Scarlet King? He's known by many names, almost always including some allusion to the color red, and then a reference to royalty or power, Harak. 
Kaharak, the Red Shah, the Crimson Khan, PTE 616 Mendez Ex Machina, the Laha Raja, and, of course, SCP-001, to name a few. And like many of the Foundation's mysterious enemies, stories about his true nature and origins abound and are often contradictory. According to the official SCP-001 files of Tufto's proposal, symbology of the Scarlet King has existed in multiple cultures throughout history, with the king often depicted the same way, as a huge, red, demonic figure often wearing a gold crown or other headdress indicating royalty. He shows up looking similarly within different cultures' mythologies. Despite existing at different points in history, or them not having the means to communicate with one another, a number of entities that the SCP Foundation is familiar with are believed to be somehow connected to the Scarlet King, including SCP-2317, a wooden door leading to the realm of a being known as the Devourer, who is expected to escape and cause an apocalyptic event in the next 30 years. But really, there's no way of knowing just how many SCPs are directly connected to the Scarlet King. Strangely, the Foundation's official file on the Scarlet King once designated his containment class as Keter, but that has since been downgraded to safe. According to the file, any attempt to change this designation is likely to lead to horrifying results. It is widely known that the Scarlet King still has considerable influence over a number of groups, individuals, and anomalies in our universe. And if ever he made his way into our universe, it would likely lead to the irreversible damage of reality itself. So then why safe? And why are the O5 Council so adamant that it remained that way? Getting to the bottom of this mystery is exactly why we're here today. But to fully grasp the true nature of the Scarlet King, we must first understand the man whose life and fate have always been tied to it, Dr. Robert Montauk. If that name feels oddly familiar to you, it's because of its association with one of the Scarlet King's most recent attempts to enter our reality, SCP-231. This SCP, often referred to as the Brides of the Scarlet King, was formed of seven women. Seven, by the way, being an extremely significant number for the King, all kidnapped by the most recent in a long line of the King's devoted cults known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these seven unfortunate women were impregnated with anomalous horrors, such as the infamous SCP-682, and every time one of these horrors were birthed, a catastrophe occurred and the mother died. At the time, Dr. Montauk was a prominent researcher studying this anomaly, and as six catastrophes had already occurred, pressure was mounting to figure out a way to prevent the final birth. But as he was working on the issue, Dr. Montauk was struck with a personal tragedy. The mysterious disappearance of his 14-year-old brother Jacob. In his fear and anger, Montauk believed that this must have something to do with the Scarlet King and his disciples. Wanting revenge, Montauk proposed an idea so horrifying that the details were never made public. A procedure known as 110 Montauk, to be performed on the final bride at regular intervals. However, this wasn't the end of Dr. Montauk's fraught relationship with the Scarlet King. It was just the beginning. To give you some perspective on just how dangerous the Scarlet King is, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition decided to put aside their differences and form a joint effort to stamp out the children of the Scarlet King. They were successful in this mission, and even managed to capture the children's leader, a mysterious man named Depeche Spivak. Dr. Montauk, who became the lead researcher on 231 and 2317, was naturally the first choice for interviewing Depeche about the true nature of the children and of the Scarlet King. Dr. Montauk could never be the impartial interviewer that the SCP Foundation wanted, though. The suspicion that the Scarlet King or the children had something to do with the loss of his younger brother still lingered just beneath the surface. Like a lot of cult leaders, Depeche was extremely cryptic in his answers to Dr. Montauk's questioning. He'd already heard of the doctor from the reputation of the horrifying Montauk procedure, and was surprised to see him so calm and courteous in person. A few key facts about the king and his cult were revealed in the first few rounds of questioning. 
The children had once worked with the serpent's hand before being excommunicated for their allegiance to the king, and they had stolen sacred texts from the mystical Wanderer's Library to assist in their summoning rituals. Depeche also revealed that the Scarlet King is bound by three laws. The Law of Blood, the Law of Concrete, and the Law of Howling. Dr. Montauk, confused and frustrated by Depeche's secrecy, had to learn more. He found an old memoir from a former member of the Children of the Scarlet King, Jack Hirsch, who had the ability to invade the minds of people from the past and experience what they experienced. He recounted a battle between the Scarlet King and his followers, and a group of time-traveling Turkmen warriors from SCP-3838. Hurst saw both sides of the battle. From the perspective of the Children of the Scarlet King, their lord ruled over them from an immense fortress embedded in a volcano. From the perspective of the Turkmen, the children were starved and beaten peasants, commanded by the king's voice in the roaring howl of the wind. Montauk also found extensive records of summoning rituals performed by various Scarlet King-aligned cults. Interestingly, some of them incorporated the use of carved SCP Foundation symbols. What could this mean? Montauk returned again to Depeche, who finally gave him the truth about the Law of Blood. This is the Law of the Scarlet King. It's defined by poverty, violence, starvation, hate, and most of all, fear. Like the serfs in the Middle Ages, persecuted by and subjected to violence from the nobles. To the children of the Scarlet King, this sense of holy pain and awe is the only way to live. The alternative is the Law of Concrete, which means the modern age defined by empty safety and false comfort. Buildings, easy to access food, healthcare, knowledge, technology. This is everything that the Scarlet King despises. But the mystery only deepened as Montauk found files from a former Foundation operative by the name of Agent de Beauvoir. Montauk learned that the Scarlet King didn't seem to appear until after the Foundation was created. And in fact, it seemed that the greater interest the Foundation took in the Scarlet King, the more powerful he became. How could this be? Things were also getting stranger on a personal level for Dr. Montauk. Depeche repeatedly pressed him about his brother's disappearance and the Montauk procedure during the interviews. Little by little, it was beginning to take its toll. The questions still plagued him. What was the law of howling? Who or what really is the Scarlet King? How did he come to be? Montauk's search was causing him to act more like the children of the Scarlet King, ranting about the horrors of the modern world how all of us are living a lie, how the only honest way to live is suffering under the dominion of the Scarlet King. This philosophy is summed up in the words of one cultist named Arya Dene Cartwright, who said, We must learn what it is to die, to be enslaved, truly, brutally enslaved, with no compassion or compunction from our masters. We must learn what it is to be taken towards a single purpose, to know and truly understand our lack of agency. We must be beholden to the words of gods and darkness, the tempest-tossed refuse of a race of fools. We must kill modernity, postmodernity, with all its analysis and sneering observation. There is only one rule, the rule of chaos, for humanity, for life, for the Scarlet King. Basically, any time humanity tries to exert control over the world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. Every time they try to understand or organize or categorize their world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. As colonial and imperial powers conquered and invaded lands like India, Africa, and South America, and subjugated their beliefs under Western ideas, the Scarlet King grew stronger. Montauk was beginning to truly understand the power of his enemy here. And even worse, he was starting to understand his part in it. Montauk, slowly being driven mad by the knowledge he was gaining, realized that the Scarlet King's greatest enemy, the SCP Foundation, was also its greatest asset. Every time they tried to understand the monster, to give him some kind of comprehensible form, they only made him more powerful. Just in time with Montauk's new revelation, 
A red crack appeared in the wall of Depeche Spivak's containment cell, a portal to the realm of the Scarlet King. Foundation staff found they were unable to enter the cell, and Depeche demanded a final interview with Montauk. With no other options, the Foundation relented. In their very last conversation, Depeche congratulated Montauk for finally understanding what he was dealing with. The Scarlet King, Depeche told him, is an idea, a concept. He is a being given power through the conflict between the old and the new. This is the law of the howling. The Scarlet King's endless rage at the direction the world and humanity has taken. The King, according to Depeche, hated the Foundation's belief that science and rationality was the true path to progress. The King saw this as little more than petty arrogance. The reason Montauk's procedure on the final bride of the Scarlet King was so effective was because it wasn't born out of science. It was born out of hate, pain, the desire for revenge, and in the Scarlet King's realm, that would be all there is. Unless our world, and especially the Foundation, changed its course, the Scarlet King's rise to absolute power would be inevitable. Montauk, his mind practically gone, asked one last question. Did the children or the Scarlet King take his brother, Jacob? When Depeche told him the answer, no. And in response, Montauk shot him dead, finally bringing an end to the children of the Scarlet King. In light of his new revelations, Montauk begged the O5 Council to change their ways in order to avoid letting the Scarlet King break into our reality. They refused, saying Montauk's ideas were too radical. But they knew they couldn't just ignore the threat posed by the Scarlet King. They would have to take some steps. And so the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation, the most powerful and secretive group in the entire world, in order to prevent the most dangerous threat that humanity has ever known from breaking into our reality and enslaving all the people of the world, finally did something. They changed the classification of the Scarlet King from Keter to Safe and made its description on the official Foundation files deliberately vague. The O5 Council thinks this will be enough to stop the Scarlet King's power from continuing to grow, but Montauk knew it wasn't enough. He had seen the truth, and he couldn't unsee it. While the Foundation was going on as normal, Montauk grew to despise them. He knew the Scarlet King was coming, he knew that he couldn't be stopped, and that our whole reality was little more than sitting ducks. Dr. Robert Montauk is no longer a researcher for the SCP Foundation. No, Dr. Robert Montauk chose a different path. He's now a child of the Scarlet King, a devotee of madness, hate, and chaos. You can't beat the Scarlet King after all, and as the old adage goes, if you can't beat him, join him. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, which is the part of the Old Testament that details God creating the world and humanity during a particularly busy week, then you might just be already familiar with SCP-001, or at least one of the anomalies that's been proposed for the title of SCP-001. Because of course, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all of creation that is thought by Foundation researchers to be one of the most dangerous beings in this and any other universe. But the Scarlet King isn't the only incredibly powerful being categorized as SCP-001. In fact, there are plenty of other anomalies with similar levels of destructive power. And one such being is a creature codenamed the Gate Guardian. Standing at well over a thousand feet tall, the Gate Guardian is impossible to be fully contained by any means that the Foundation possesses. The anomaly itself, despite its colossal size, is humanoid in its shape, sporting wings that protrude from its back. While it usually has four of these, SCP-001 has historically been seen to have any number of wings between 2 and 108, sprouting from various places over its body including its shoulders, ankles, wrists, and even its temples. This gigantic guardian also carries its own weapon, referred to as SCP-001-2. 
This weapon resembles an enormous knife or sword, capable of emitting plumes of flame. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the temperature of the flames produced by SCP-001 rival that of our very own Sun. For reference, the Sun has a core temperature of over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and 5,778 Kelvin at its surface, or almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You would expect a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun to cause a considerable amount of damage, even if it wasn't in use, but the flames emitted by the weapon leave no lasting damage on the surrounding environment. It is capable, though, of annihilating anything that strays too close to SCP-001, burning them so intensely that their atoms literally separate breaking potential attackers apart on a molecular level. Much as its codename suggests, the Gate Guardian stands solemnly at the threshold of some form of dimensional gateway, which is equally tall as SCP-001 itself. Behind the Guardian is a lush grove, abundant with fruit trees of astronomical size, as well as other beings that share a similar appearance to SCP-001. This grove is thought to be the Garden of Eden, the paradise that God created and that was inhabited by Adam and Eve, the first two humans in existence, according to the book of Genesis. As the tale goes, the pair were created by God himself and permitted to live in the Garden of Eden as long as they followed a single rule. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat any of the fruit that grew from certain trees that God had specified. Within view just behind the Gate Guardian are two immense trees, one bearing apples and the other bearing different fruit of an unknown type. The one that looks like an apple tree is believed, even by some in the Foundation, to be the biblical tree of knowledge that Eve was convinced to pick a fateful apple from after an encounter with a snake. The other, the one with unidentifiable fruit, is thought to be the tree of life. However, this is all speculation, since it is currently impossible to venture through this gateway and verify if the realm beyond is truly the Bible's own Garden of Eden. This is largely because anything that breaches a kilometer-wide radius of SCP-001 is instantly vaporized. The Gate Guardian attacks with imperceptible speed, using its flaming sword to smite any person that gets too close. The Guardian actually moves so fast that it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. It appears to always remain in its solemn, dutiful stance with its weapon drawn and head bowed, only shifting for a fraction of a nanosecond to attack. Ranged attacks against the Guardian are just as ineffective, with all projectiles fired at SCP-001 reduced to atoms before they can do any harm. Even if said projectile happens to be a nuclear weapon, the Gate Guardian will be able to subatomically vaporize both the projectile itself as well as the person who sent it, regardless of how far away they are, all while not appearing to lift a finger. During an experiment involving SCP-001 on December 26, 2004, an SCP Foundation nuclear submarine called Nautilus launched a series of multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian. The retaliation from the Guardian resulted not only in the deaths of approximately 35,000 innocent civilians, but the blast is also believed by some to have inadvertently caused the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. The severity of this incident came dangerously close to revealing the Foundation's existence to the world, resulting in them rapidly deploying any means necessary to erase any trace of the 35,000 victims' families, friends, and other related individuals. In order to avoid questioning, the SCP Foundation administered amnestics on an almost worldwide scale and the O5 Council banned any further tests on SCP-001 that involved nuclear weapons. In what was hoped by the Foundation to be a test with lower stakes, they sent an expendable D-Class personnel towards SCP-001. The D-Class approached the area where the Gate Guardian is located, and as soon as they saw it, they could hear a very clear command in their mind. Leave. The D-Class personnel reacted exactly the same way you or I would. They promptly turned and started to walk away. They didn't need a thousand-foot-tall entity with a flaming sword to tell them twice. The researchers running the experiment were not swayed by the request and ordered the D-Class to continue moving towards SCP-001. When the D-Class continued to ignore their commands, they were terminated as is standard policy when dealing with an insubordinate member of D-Class. SCP-001 appeared not to like this for some reason, though, 
and the researcher site as well as the researchers themselves were immediately obliterated by an unknown force, though it's a pretty safe guess that a certain flaming weapon was responsible. This candidate for SCP-001 may be one of, if not the most powerful being that the SCP Foundation has ever encountered. And according to its entry in the SCP-001 file, the Guardian is even responsible for the creation of the Foundation itself. If the file is to be believed, the administrator of the SCP Foundation one day heard a word echoing through his head. Prepare. This one-word instruction led him to starting the SCP Foundation, containing countless dangerous anomalies and entities in preparation for an uncertain future. In all that time, since the very beginning of the Foundation, the Gate Guardian has remained standing at its post. While it is not aggressive nor openly hostile towards humanity, the Gate Guardian doesn't seem to care much for us either, at least as individuals. It rarely interacts with human beings when left unprovoked, and venturing too close to the Guardian, however, is not an automatic death sentence. The Guardian first communicates with any living being approaching it via a telepathic message, instructing them to either leave or forget. If whomever has stepped too close to SCP-001 complies with the instructions, they'll be able to freely leave the area, while simultaneously forgetting every detail of the Gate Guardian's existence. Ignore these warnings, though, and SCP-001 has no qualms about completely eliminating you from reality. Given its enormous destructive potential, it is no wonder that the Foundation has tried to use the Gate Guardian to eliminate other dangerous SCPs, each with varying results. The Foundation at one time even attempted to use the Gate Guardian to destroy the infamously indestructible SCP-682, better known by the appropriate name of the hard-to-destroy reptile. Due to the malicious contempt SCP-682 holds for human beings and all other forms of life, it is perhaps one of the most dangerous anomalies the SCP Foundation has in containment. SCP-682 is also one of the few creatures the Foundation actively wants to terminate, a task made that much harder given that 682 can regenerate its entire form from as little as a single cell. The Gate Guardian had already shown time and time again that it was capable of massive destruction, and researchers working for the Foundation hoped to harness that power to rid the world of SCP-682 for good. 682 was placed on an unmanned vehicle and carried to within one kilometer of the Gate Guardian. The Guardian attacked the vehicle, seriously wounding but not killing 682. It seemed even the mighty SCP-001 couldn't kill the hard-to-destroy reptile. While the researchers were disappointed with this result, it is worth noting that 682 made a very interesting comment to the Guardian. 682 mentioned that the Gate Guardian is not Uriel, but a pretender. Uriel is the archangel that some religious texts describe as the Guardian standing at the Gate of Eden with a fiery sword. So does this mean that 682 knows that the Gate Guardian is not actually an angel? Or that the location it is guarding isn't the Garden of Eden at all? Any truth or meaning behind these comments has, as of yet, been undetermined by the SCP Foundation. A later experiment involved both SCP-001 and SCP-073, the anomaly otherwise known as Cain. Cain is a male humanoid of possible Arabic descent whose arms, legs, spine, and shoulders are replaced in an almost cyborg-like fashion with beryllium bronze, much like the Gate Guardian. SCP-073 may also be the same as the one mentioned in the Bible's book of Genesis, who, according to the biblical story, murdered his own brother Abel out of spite. As punishment for his actions, Cain was cursed to eternally suffer for his wrongdoing. In the case of SCP-073, any damage inflicted on him is deflected back to the attacker, but Cain is made to feel the pain of the attack. Any plants or plant-based matter withers and rots in his presence, and he is cursed with a perfect memory, keeping him forever haunted by his murder of Abel. When Cain was brought before the Gate Guardian, an unknown incident occurred. The Foundation's records are heavily expunged, but we do know that somehow Cain's usual ability to deflect incoming damage back at his attacker had no effect on SCP-001. The encounter left SCP-073 unconscious and even permanently blinded nearby research personnel. It was as a direct result of this incident that the O5 Council demanded that no further experiments of any kind were to be conducted on SCP-001. 
with the administrator even filing an executive order that no SCPs be exposed to the Guardian, and that SCP-001 was to never be used for the attempted termination of other SCPs. Of course, perhaps it wasn't just the mistakes of the past that made the Council decide that SCP-001 was best left alone. At some point, an erratic transmission was received from Site-0 by Foundation personnel, detailing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In the transmission, the sender, believed to be another member of the SCP Foundation, described an event during which the Gate Guardian finally left its post, stepping away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. SCP-001 has left its location, the sender wrote. The gate is open. They are riding forth. Oh god, it's so beautiful. The transmission then goes on to repeat various phrases including, The Lord shall reign forever, and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What can be inferred from the rambling transmission is that the event being described is the end of the world. Some believe that once God deems it time, his angelic armies will lay waste to the earth in order to remake it as a paradise. When this occurs, SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, will open the gate he stands in front of, allowing the other beings like it to emerge into our world, ready to cleanse it. Perhaps most interesting is the source of the message. The transmission was received from within the Foundation from Site-0. However, when questioned by personnel, O5-14 told them that no such message had been sent or even existed. While some disregarded the transmission telling of the end of the world as a hoax, it was then that a timestamp was discovered. This warning had not been sent from Site-0, at least not yet, and was dated several years in the future. Despite this ominous warning of things to come, the Gate Guardian remains inactive, standing at the threshold to Eden, waiting. The Scarlet King is a really bad guy. He's a giant interdimensional nightmare god, intent on breaching our reality and wrecking terrible havoc on everything we know and love. He's been responsible for untold suffering and chaos across countless worlds, timelines, and layers of reality. To many, he's even somewhat of a final boss to the SCP Foundation. And just when you think he couldn't get any worse, it turns out that he's also a deadbeat dad. Not only did the Scarlet King once have a cult literally named the Children of the Scarlet King, before it was destroyed by Dr. Montauk and the SCP Foundation, he also had at least seven actual children. Each one is speculated to be a powerful anomaly, but it's tough to find concrete answers as to who or what exactly most of them are. So today we're putting on our researcher hats and digging deep into the Foundation's lore to present our theories on the potential progeny of the SCP Foundation's greatest enemy. And if nothing else, we may finally be able to get this Dark Lord of all evil to start paying all the child support he probably owes by now. First, if you're not well versed in Scarlet King lore, you may be wondering, how exactly does an evil Chaos God have kids? Is there a Scarlet Queen out there who prefers to stay out of the limelight? The answer isn't quite that simple, and it has everything to do with SCP-231 and Big Red's most devoted cult, the non-biological children of the Scarlet King. They kidnapped a group of seven girls and performed a number of dark rituals that resulted in them becoming vessels for the Scarlet King's seven terrible kids. These seven girls have become known as SCP-231. Anyone who accesses those files, and trust us, they aren't a pretty sight, will find that the containment procedures mostly involve performing the infamous Montauk procedure on the surviving girls to keep them from giving birth. Six of the seven brides have given birth to nightmares beyond comprehension and are now dead, with only one still remaining successfully contained. But here at the SCP Foundation, you need to learn to comprehend the incomprehensible. According to a classified document, SCP-231 may technically be a neutralized anomaly without us even knowing. And incidentally, this gives us our most certain answer on the Children of the Scarlet King. On this one, the apple fell very, very far from the tree. According to the secret document, SCP-999, that's right, the adorable tickle monster, is the seventh child of the Scarlet King. He must be so disappointed that everyone's favorite little blob didn't want to join the family business of absolute evil. For anyone who doesn't know, SCP-999 is a slimy yellow entity that only seems capable of absolute <laughs> compassion. 
It brings joy to everyone in its presence, and with prolonged exposure it can even cure disorders like PTSD, anxiety, and depression. He's so good at this that he even cured SCP-231-7, his de facto mother, of her trauma, and allowed her to return happily to her family after some amnestic treatment. The Scarlet King has another good reason to be ashamed of his cheerful blobby son. Ancient Daividi prophecy dictates that SCP-999 may someday become so powerful that his force of absolute love and good overwhelms the Scarlet King's evil and chaos. Think of him as the Luke Skywalker to the Scarlet King's Darth Vader, though we probably can't expect a cool lightsaber battle between them anytime soon. How disappointing. So if SCP-999 is the quiet, sensitive black sheep of the Scarlet family, who's the golden child who makes his evil father proud? the real chip off the old block. That would be our dear reptilian friend, SCP-682, the malicious lizard heavily implied to be a child of the Scarlet King. If you know literally anything about 682, your reaction to finding out that he's the spawn of cruelty personified is probably, yeah, that makes sense. Just as SCP-999 is the Scarlet King's innocent, optimistic young child, 682 is kind of like his edgy teenager. Still in the middle of a misanthropic phase, he shows no sign of leaving anytime soon. The fact that 682 appears to find anything about the world around him utterly disgusting seems to be a trait he inherited from his dear old dad. And the fact he seems pretty much impossible to kill also lends credence to the popular theory he's got nightmare god blood running through his veins. Mm -hmm. 682 has also started displaying a particular hatred for 999 ever since an incident where 999 tickled him into submission, so family dinners are probably extra awkward for these two. 999 and 682 are the most certain children, but that still leaves us with five more children to identify. It's worth remembering that the waters are murkier from here on in, but we've searched far and wide through the Foundation archives to find possible answers. If your interpretation differs, remember that it's just a theory, an SCP explained theory. Thankfully, we do have some assistance here. The tale Dust and Blood hinted at what each of the seven children of the Scarlet King represents, and that may help us narrow down our choices here. To put things into perspective, it's believed that 682 was the fourth child to be born, representing wrath, and 999 was the seventh, representing hope. According to this tale, the first of the seven children represents dominion, and as a result, is skilled in the ways of war and has the power to lead the king's forces to victory. According to one Foundation theorist, this child could potentially be SCP-239, also known as the Witch Child. This entity is so powerful that, as part of its normal containment procedures, it's eternally kept in a coma. Why? Because this seemingly normal child has dominion over reality and can change it to her whims. Her thoughts are so powerful that just her brainwaves can damage physical matter, and she can make things disappear or manifest in an instant. She's also impossible to kill, with skin that's almost totally impenetrable. Much like SCP-682, she's also frighteningly strong in both the offense and defense department. We're talking about such a powerful telepath that Dr. Clef has campaigned for her immediate termination, just because it's safer that way. This is certainly a frightening wonderkin that the Scarlet King would be proud to call his daughter. Next, the second child. According to the prophecy, this child represents longing. The child has the power to bring forth armies, which will help the Scarlet King in his conquest. For this, we actually have a pretty unconventional theory. SCP-029, also known as the Daughter of Darkness. If the name alone wasn't enough to suggest that she's got an extremely sinister father, she also fits the profile of being very aggressive and incredibly hard to kill. But even more damning is her connections to the symbology of longing. One of her most dangerous powers is causing men to fall into almost trance-like devotion to her. After spending time around her, they're suddenly willing to murder in her honor, strangling their victims in hopes of raising Kali, the Hindu god of destruction, whom has many similarities to the Scarlet King. She certainly fits the bill of someone capable of raising armies in the Dark Lord's name. One strike against our Scarlet King connection theory is that the file states the Daughter of Darkness was first discovered in India, 
which wouldn't match up with the other information we know to be fact. However, while this is a long shot, given the sensitive nature of everything involving the Scarlet King, it's extremely possible that false information was supplied to bury the connection. Considering the cover-ups and lies involving anomalies like SCP-1000, this certainly isn't an unprecedented move on the part of the Foundation. Next, the third child. This child is associated with all things desolation, implying destruction, fire, ashes, pestilence, and death across the battlefield. When it comes to spreading destruction and death on a mass scale, one particular SCP comes to mind. SCP-058, the heart of darkness. This creature has Scarlet King written all over it. It's evil, it's mysterious, it's pretty much impossible to kill, and it causes mass casualties every time it escapes its containment chamber. It causes fires, whips people to death with its razor-sharp tendrils, and sprays highly corrosive acid from its scorpion-like tail. And it's even red. Given that we know for a fact this entity suddenly emerged out of something that's now been expunged from the records in an undisclosed site, it's extremely possible that the entity 058 came from was SCP-231-3. This is a child that the Scarlet King would definitely be proud of, given that it's impossible to reason with and feels solely motivated by causing destruction, misery, and chaos. We can't think of an entity that better suits the desolation moniker than SCP-058. Next, skipping past SCP-682 at number 4, the fifth child of the Scarlet King is associated with the loose concept of lack. The prophecy then goes into more detail, saying that this child is powerful in the ways of magic and is able to use their abilities to cause great destruction. Here we have another unconventional proposal. What if child number five wasn't actually a child, but children? That's because we think this description perfectly fits SCP-1765, the nightmarish reality-warping sisters, who we think may actually be triplets of the Scarlet King's fifth bride. Now hear us out. These are actually some of the most powerful enemies the Foundation has ever attempted to contain and we know nothing about their past before being bound to a few objects by the serpent's hand. These sadistic reality warpers are so devastatingly powerful that the only action the Foundation can take against them is letting them have free reign over the containment site they currently inhabit. All the Foundation can do is hope they never get bored of tormenting the people inside. As we all know, the Scarlet King despises science, progress, and order. So perhaps a perfect punishment for the Foundation in his many eyes is giving them a taste of their own medicine. The sisters, though particularly their ringleader, are a perverse shadow of the Foundation's love of the scientific method. They take these methods and use them for an activity that the Scarlet King finds much more enjoyable – tormenting and killing people. Whenever these crafty triplets set their mind to it, their horrifically powerful magic is able to cause massive devastation just like the prophecy for the fifth bride's offspring dictates. And finally, the sixth child of the Scarlet King. The concept associated with this one is hidden, meaning it can change its face and walk unnoticed through creation. It's also said to have the responsibility of opening the ways between worlds and allowing the war to end all wars to first begin. There have been a huge number of guesses for this spot, with some even suggesting SCP-055, the anti-meme. But since we're having fun here, we also want to make an even wilder suggestion. We posit that the sixth child of the Scarlet King is Allison Chow, also known as LS and the Black Queen, the most powerful member of the Serpent's Hand. We get it, we have a lot of explaining to do, but hear us out. Allison Chow is a member of the Serpent's Hand, or technically many members. Multiple versions of her exist across parallel dimensions in the SCP multiverse. They're mostly all estranged daughters of Foundation researcher Dr. Charles Gears. This estrangement leads them to collaborate in the Wanderer's Library, the secret base of the Serpent's Hand, to conduct raids on the Foundation in revenge. But what if the leader of these alternate Allisons had an ulterior motive? Because in the infinite number of possibilities offered by the multiverse, this one was not the daughter of Charles Gears, but the Scarlet King. She's merely using the pain of her counterparts to manipulate them into accomplishing her true father's goal, undermining the SCP Foundation. Let's break it down. The hidden child is prophesied to walk unnoticed through creation, 
Not only does Allison Chow appear human, the use of SCP-268, a newsboy cap that causes the wearer to become unnoticed, allows her to walk anywhere through creation without being detected. But most importantly of all, the hidden child is said to be the one who opens the way for the Scarlet King's entrance into our dimension. And Allison Chow has access to the Wanderer's Library, an unfettered access point between dimensions. If one of the infinite Allisons was the secret daughter of the Scarlet King, would the Wanderer's Library not be a perfect way for him to leave his own dimension and enter ours? She could be the final piece he needs, hidden under the nose of the Foundation and the Serpent's Hand, making all the secret power plays to allow for the Scarlet King's eventual bloody revenge on our world. Unless, of course, SCP-999, the family disappointment, stops him first. We realize that some of these theories may seem surprising, but when it comes to the anomalous, especially the Scarlet King, the only thing you can ever expect is the unexpected. Do you agree with our theories? If not, who do you think are the children of the Scarlet King? Let us know down in the comments. One thing is for certain. We hope we never meet any of the terrible tyrant's nasty children. Except the Tickle Monster, of course. He can hang with us anytime. Any changes today? The younger security officer Zack asked as he stepped into the watchtower. As if, replied his superior, a jaded, cynical old man who insisted on being referred to as Mr. Jefferson. The darn thing hasn't moved, spoken, or done so much as stretch one of those wings of his. Another day at the office then, Zack jumped. Through the window, the pair of them looked through at the towering figure a few kilometers away. SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, stood motionless, its fiery sword in its hand, ever protecting its post at the precipice between our world and paradise. It had long been stationed at the entrance of a dimensional gateway that led to what was believed to be the Garden of Eden, described in the Biblical Old Testament. Much like the security officers in the Foundation's base tasked with watching the Guardian, this was pretty much the extent of the day's activities. Hey, did you see that news about the uh, transfer posting? Zack asked, trying to stave off boredom with as much conversation he could squeeze out of his fellow officer. Yeah, I saw it. Mr. Jefferson scoffed, rolling his eyes. What possesses someone like Robert Montauk to come down here? Eh, must have wanted a quieter post, Zack reasoned, looking out at the stillness of the Gate Guardian. Won't find one any quieter than here, Jefferson mused. Him showing up will be the most exciting thing that's happened here in a long while. Unbeknownst to both Zack and Mr. Jefferson, Dr. Robert Montauk would be only joining the team at the Gate Guardian observation site for a short while. Not one of them, nor anybody else within the Foundation, could ever guess Montauk's true intentions behind venturing there in the first place. He wanted an audience with the Gate Guardian itself. Approaching the colossal thousand-foot-tall being, Dr. Montauk crossed the threshold of the minimum safe distance from the Guardian. Given the sheer heat of its weapon, hotter than Earth's sun, anything within a kilometer of SCP-001 was at risk of being obliterated, vaporized into atoms if they didn't turn back. Which, through a voice that immediately rang out in Montauk's ears, the Gate Guardian commanded him to do. Leave. Its psychic message boomed. Wait, wait, Dr. Montauk urged, holding up his hands in what would have been a futile defense against the Guardian Sword. I know what you do when people don't listen to your commands, but please, just give me a minute. There was silence. SCP-001 didn't reply. There was nobody else close enough to hear Montauk speak to it. So, he continued. You are impossibly old. We know that much about you. And because of that, you must have seen things that we can't even begin to imagine, much less fully comprehend. But I've come a very long way to request that you impart some information to me, if you can. He paused again, as if waiting for a reply that never came. The Gate Guardian merely stood in the same defensive, unwavering stance. Tell me, please, how much do you know about the Scarlet King? By this point in time, although the Foundation was yet to realize, Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly going insane. His investigations into an anomalous entity known as the Scarlet King were gradually corrupting him, as he tried relentlessly to quantify exactly what this entity was and how great of a threat it posed. Little did Montauk realize that, in trying so hard to define and comprehend the being, he was inadvertently fueling its power, 
The Scarlet King was an interdimensional warmonger, an embodiment of hatred and chaos, and Dr. Robert Montauk was slowly falling under the King's influence. Upon hearing the tiny human figure utter his question, the Immense Gate Guardian rebuted with another single word psychic command, one it had never been recorded giving before. WITNESS! As if his increasing instability and the creeping influence of the Scarlet King hadn't made Montauk feel bad enough, he instantly felt sick. There was a searing pain behind his eyes, like he was staring directly at the sun, accompanied by a nausea that made his head spin. It took a moment of enduring the horrific sensation before he realized what was happening. The Guardian was trying to show him something. Rather than give any information on the Scarlet King verbally, SCP-001 was imparting a psychic vision onto Montauk, a memory of events long past, the answers he sought, a warning, or perhaps all three. The vision showed Montauk a time so long ago that it couldn't ever be forgotten for there was barely anyone alive to remember it in the first place. It was eons in the past, long before the comparatively recent dawn of humanity, a time only spoken of in the Dust and Blood Tablet, an artifact of the Davite civilization, some of the earliest worshippers of the Scarlet King himself. And there, marching up to the entrance of Eden, was the crimson-clad Eldritch Abomination and a horde of horrors with him. According to the story recorded in the Dust and Blood Tablet, this would have been much earlier in the life of the Scarlet King, perhaps even before he assumed his now infamous title. Back then, he would most likely have been known as his original name of Kanthrak, one of multiple siblings born when the Tree of Life was planted, and thus created all life in the multiverse. But being the only one of his siblings cursed with awareness, knowing the pain his existence brought him, Kamhrak would eventually set out on his lifelong mission to destroy all of existence across every dimension. And he started by killing his siblings, consuming them to claim their power for himself. Around this time in prehistory, the being that would one day become known as Scarlet King didn't quite possess the power that he would several millennia later. Although that's not to say he was an unformidable force of destruction, fueled by his singular hatred for existence. His vow to destroy extended to the Tree of Life that had caused him to be, along with the tree's creator and all of their creation. In other words, everything in the multiverse, all of creation, if you will. So what was the Scarlet King doing there so long ago, at the dimensional doorway protected by the Gate Guardian? Well, beyond the boundary, between it and the rest of the infinite multiverse, lay the supposed Garden of Eden. While it is unknown if it is, in fact, the same Eden referred to in the Book of Genesis is up for debate, especially among the Foundation. But at a glance, even through the gate, it certainly does look like a paradise. The space is filled with lush vegetation of astronomical size, populated by a number of beings that seem to resemble the Gate Guardian itself. And there, protected by its watchful caretaker, are two trees. One is thought to be the Tree of Knowledge, that Eve was tricked into eating an apple from during the Book of Genesis. The other, however, bears an unknown type of fruit, and is widely believed to be the Tree of Life. Now back in the modern age, there's never been a conclusive link between the Tree of Life mentioned by the Davites and their barbaric civilization's legends regarding the creation of the Scarlet King, but the fact that so long ago he and his most feared generals were bearing down on the Gate Guardian's position, defending a garden where there was known to be a tree of that description, well, it all seems rather conclusive now. Alongside Kaharak were six of his seven daughters, each one of them a fearsome abomination much like their destructive father. As they approached, not one needed to exchange any words with their angelic protector of Eden. The Gate Guardian knew what these monsters were here for. They would stop at nothing to pass through his gate and uproot the Tree of Life, the progenitor of all living beings in all of existence. Even though it was early in Kathrak's career as the rampaging interdimensional warlord he so is, he was as steadfast as ever in his goal to annihilate every corner of creation, every dimension, every parallel plane of reality, every single pocket of existence across infinity. They'd all come undone if he burned the Tree of Life, pulled it out at the roots, and splintered it until nothing remained. 
to the once and future Scarlet King that the same tree had led to his own tortured existence. It was the source of his suffering, and it had to be destroyed. The only thing standing in his way was a figure as colossal as Kamparak himself, wielding a flaming sword. Leave! Boomed the psychic voice of the Gate Guardian. It was like a doorman standing before a group of rowdy teenagers trying to force their way into a movie theater. Except these rowdy teens were the Scarlet King, his horrifying daughters, and the forces he had already amassed since his creation. The Horde stood ready, waiting for the commands of their king, who they thought would gladly lead the charge as they marched on the Garden of Eden to begin the destruction of existence. But that's not what happened. Usually, the Scarlet King would never shy away from a fight, preferring to lead the charge when it came to a slaughter. Instead, he commanded his first daughter, Atibet, to commence the first attack on the protector who stood in their path. On her foul father's word, Ativik took her horde and charged at the Guardian. What she and her forces lacked in numerical advantage, Ativik more than made up for in her knowledge of war. She hungered for it, sought dominion. That was her seal, after all. And yet, in the face of this impending onslaught, the Gate Guardian remained still, rooted to the same spot it had as always, and would always be standing in. A number of Ativik's minions burst into flames, the very fabric of their crude form separated on a molecular level as they were effortlessly rendered into nothingness. Still, the Gate Guardian hadn't appeared to move an inch, had exerted no energy, despite the damage it had done to Ativik and her forces in defense of Eden. As his first daughter screeched and howled in despair at the decimation of her horde, her children, the Scarlet King decided he needed to better understand his opponent. With a wave of his clawed crimson hand, the king commanded his next daughter, Aghor, to send forth her own army. In a tidal wave of nightmarish creatures, Aghor sent her horrific children into battle. She possessed a far greater quantity to do battle on her father's behalf. Perhaps Aghor even believed that was the Scarlet King's plan. With a greater number of her forces over her sisters, maybe she would be able to overwhelm the Guardian. But even as her own children began to be vaporized the closer that they got to the gate, Aghor had no idea she was little more than a pawn being sacrificed so that Kanra could learn more about his imposing angelic enemy. Another of the Scarlet King's daughters, a being known as Anhwit, was the next called up to contribute to the unfolding battle. Although, to call it a battle undersells just how easily the Gate Guardian seemed to be eliminating the oncoming forces without even moving. While an outwardly frail-seeming creature, Anhuit's primary strength over her sisters was a proficiency in magic, her innate ability to warp and reshape reality around her. It was that power that had caused her father to be wary of her, viewing Anhuit's abilities as a threat to his leadership. And so, Kantrak had her crippled and all her children, leaving them unable to overthrow him, but still loyal to their king. Obeying her father's command, perhaps out of the same loyalty or fear that he would harm her and her children further if she disobeyed, Anhuit unfurled her magic. She reshaped the world around them, making it so that the passage of time moved so much slower. And that was what revealed to the Scarlet King his enemy's greatest strength in combat. The Gate Guardian had so far been able to obliterate both Ativik and now Akhor's forces without seeming to move, but it wasn't by standing still. It was moving, just much faster than the blink of Scarlet King's multiple eyes. Now that Anhuit's magic had slowed the passage of time, the Gate Guardian could be seen doing battle. As Akhor's atrocities spilled towards the Angel to try and overwhelm it, it effortlessly blocked the oncoming attacks with its sword. Everything the Flaming Blade connected with instantly evaporated, bursting into atoms as they were practically cleaved out of existence by the Gate Guardian's mighty weapon. Even with time slowed to a crawl, the towering Winged Protector of Eden only appeared to be moving at an average speed. But when time flowed normally, without Anhuit manipulating reality, the Guardian was simply too fast to be observed. Resisting the urge to dive headfirst into the fight himself, the Scarlet King knew it would likely lead to his untimely demise. He refused to accept that. It could not happen. But he still had yet to amass the strength he would need as he continued his ascent. So while time was slowed to a crawl and the Gate Guardian was still engaged in combat with Aghor's forces, he turned to another of his remaining daughters, Adista. If the Scarlet King and his forces couldn't get past the Guardian, 
they could still try to get to the Tree of Life while the Protector's focus was diverted. Adisan unleashed a wave of pestilence, sickness, and disease spewing from her in a cloud of vapor, heading straight towards the Angelic Garden and Eden's entrance beyond. The Scarlet King knew this latest attack wouldn't phase or weaken the Gate Guardian. He hoped the foul smog would instead pass through the gateway itself into the garden. As Adisat sent forth her power, blood and ash soaked the landscape around them. All the plants outside the entrance to Eden withered and died, shriveling and decomposing as the disgusting fog rolled towards the gate. It washed over the Guardian, whose form only seemed to glow brighter as he repelled the pestilence. It was as if it didn't even need to think about it, still focused on finishing off the rest of the oncoming army. As its glow intensified, so did the fiery sword that the Gate Guardian swung with ease and finesse. Flames burst from the blade, the encroaching fumes catching fire, along with the air itself. It ignited in a wave of fire, a defensive inferno that repelled this latest attack. But for a brief few moments, while time stayed slow, before Anhui's hold on reality inevitably broke, the king had sent forth Atilif. Of all his spawn, she was the most reserved, keeping mostly to herself, never speaking. She and her children could change their faces and forms, shift into anything or anyone, and walk undetected through the multiverse. And now her father was employing her incredible stealth abilities to slip behind enemy lines, while the Gate Guardian was finishing off the remaining onslaught from Kanhrak's other daughters. It was as Atilif drew near, creeping unseen closer and closer to the entrance, keeping the Scarlet King out of Eden, that the Guardian seemed to pause. It slowly, ominously turned its huge head, tilting until it was looking directly at Atilif. If its expression could be seen, maybe the Gate Guardian would almost be impressed that someone was able to sneak past it. After all, it was a feat that no other being in creation could ever hope to accomplish. But then again, with its steadfast conviction and dedication to its protective duty, maybe it would have looked upon Atilif with anger. With a cleaving swing of its scorching sword, the Gate Guardian unfurled a tidal wave of fire that engulfed everything around it. Not just Atilif, but Ativik, Aghor, and Adista, all the king's daughters that had attacked so far, along with every one of their own children, were instantly obliterated. They were all reduced to empty, vacant spaces where they had once been, their atoms separated by the searing swing of the Guardian's weapon. The devastating blow by his adversary did little to deter the Scarlet King from his mission. He was still set on destroying the Tree of Life, and no loss was too great in his pursuit of destroying existence. He barely cared that four of his own daughters had just been unmade by the Guardian. Anhuit was still there clinging on to time as if it were a thrashing animal. The Scarlet King could simply make her restore her fallen sisters and their forces. He had lost nothing, but had held back for too long, and slowly drew his own weapon out of thin air. Wielding a sword that was as blood-soaked as the Guardian's was hot, the Scarlet King locked blades with the one being standing in their way. Both the ancient Angelic Defender and the attacking Eldritch Abomination were evenly matched. Every one of their vicious strikes against the other met with an equally strong parry. A weapon of extreme, all-consuming heat blocked swipes from a sharp, serrated edge that matched the deep red that would be forever synonymous with Kankrak. The force of their two swords clashing and striking each other was so great that it rippled out from their one-on-one -on -one fight. The landscape around them was flattened, wiped clean of any remaining plant life that hadn't already been destroyed by the forces of the king's daughters. Despite having acquired nowhere near the power he would thousands of years after this fight, the Scarlet King was still a formidable force in single combat, and yet the Gate Guardian seemed incapable of tiring or weakening, still standing strong against the onslaught. Even after wiping multiple armies out with its flaming sword, the Guardian was still able to hold its own against the Scarlet King, who was furious, enraged at being so close to the Tree of Life, yet unable to get past his angelic adversary. He'd need to be stronger, faster, even more ruthless than the warlord he already was. Despite Anhuit slowing down time, the King and the Guardian were at a stalemate. Time. That was it. 
the Scarlet King needed more time. Withdrawing from the fight, he realized that this was a battle that could not be won by sheer brute force alone. His mission to destroy all creation, to get to the Tree of Life, would take cunning, deception, and more time. If he let it, the Gate Guardian could easily kill Kantra. Its flaming weapon could cleave him out of existence, and that would end the King's torment. But it wouldn't be enough. A death would be unsatisfying knowing that the rest of existence would go on after he was gone. The Scarlet King couldn't accept that. It wasn't enough. So he did the one thing nobody would expect of him. He made a deal with the Gate Guardian. It was an action still fueled by his infinite hatred for all existence, his yearning for total chaos. The Scarlet King knew that one day, an event would arrive where the Guardian and the other beings like it in the Garden of Eden would spill forth and deliver judgment on this world. And when that rapture happened, the Tree of Life would be undefended. The Scarlet King bartered with the Guardian that he would retreat for the time being so he could spend eons amassing more and more power. Then, when the fateful day arrived, the Gate Guardian would allow him into Eden to destroy the Tree of Life, while it and its brethren were busy conducting the rapture. Halting their fight, the Scarlet King offered a Crimson Claw to the Gate Guardian's burning hand. Returning to reality from the intense vision, still feeling sick at what he had witnessed, Robert Montauk looked up at the still, silent form of the Gate Guardian. Did you do it? He yelled, desperate to know more through his obsession with the Scarlet King. Did you tell him yes? Did you make a deal? There was no answer from the Guardian, just a single word that echoed through Montauk's fractured mind. Leave. The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the Sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classify the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated. Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked Research Team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O51. O51 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O51 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. O51 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, 
and especially its leader 051 to solve the problems of item 001 and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. <gasps> when Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. O51 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control Item 001, O51 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. O51 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. Perhaps the disastrous side effects of item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But O51 and the Omega-5 team need more data, and for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna Church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where Item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though, and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, O51 decided to move the entire Item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of Item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticized O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret, a secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5 a secret that has to do with the Item 001 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects O51 makes his breakthrough with are children, nine of them to be exact, all between four and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required O51 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only O51 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power. But not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they force to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with Item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of, what they've done, all except 051.
The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns, and only O51 has the key to control it. The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed five kilometers away. 051 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to 051 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs 051 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. 051 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out, this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. 051 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. 051 smiles. The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, 3 meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. 051 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. 051 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. Mm -hmm. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. The worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area. Deadly and precise. 051 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, 051 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in Item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use Item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way 051 is running the program. The updates that 051 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to 051 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, 051 will be promoted to director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site-001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work, and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area, where the powers of Item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new superweapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far-off kingdom but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. What's going on? 
The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The armed agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a Thaumiel entity. The smell of fire and oil fills the air. The sound of gears grinding can be heard between the explosions and shrieks of terror. A man runs out of his house, only to have his leg grabbed by a metal arm and dragged back through his front door. SCP-001 leaves a trail of metal fragments and mechanical parts on the ground in the wake of its destruction. Iron chains swing from its form. Cast iron gears whirl within it. A glowing light throbs from the center of its body. SCP-001 is consuming everything in its path. After incorporating the truck chassis into its being, SCP-001 rolls in a lumbering fashion to the next house. It rips the gutters from the side of the building. Residents who live in the area flee their neighborhood, all the while hoping that the mechanical monstrosity skips over their house so they have something to return to if they make it out alive. A section of SCP-001's undercarriage drops away from the main body. It rolls down the street, consuming more and more material. The new entity resembles a human spine and rib cage. It topples over, unable to support itself. The rib-like formations extend out to grab anything and everything within reach. The newly incorporated material forms what can only be described as a head. Light from within the eye sockets fixate on nearby civilians. The metallic creature picks up the people and places them inside its exposed steel rib cage. Then it turns and spots a woman helplessly trying to crawl away. The creature reaches out with a spiked tentacle and wraps it around the woman's body. She is placed inside of the chest cavity. Moments later, a severed hand falls out of the entity and onto the ground. The mechanical monster continues to gather bodies and materials, incorporating them into its frame. A growth begins to slowly expand on its back. It becomes so massive that the creature falls over and uses its limbs to scurry to a nearby house. There is a sickening crunching sound as the growth bursts. From within emerges three humanoid creatures resembling the civilians that the entity had consumed earlier. A female with chains extending from her scalp like dreadlocks stumbles away. The second humanoid is a man with cogs for limbs. He examines the clock-like components that have been incorporated into his body, then stares blankly into the distance. The third humanoid lies motionless on the ground. He did not make it. The two functioning humanoids look at their creator intently. For a moment, nothing moves. Then, as if they have been given orders telepathically, the half-human, half-machine humanoids turn and run away from the mayhem. A few weeks before the massacre caused by what would be designated as SCP-001, the Foundation had been in contact with the Allied Occult Initiative. There were rumors of an anomalous object in Mexico being worshipped by a group of people who identified themselves as the Church of the Broken God. Intel about the church claimed their deity was a small mechanical box filled with cogs and pistons. The box supposedly had supernatural abilities. It was said to be able to communicate with congregants of the Church of the Broken God telepathically. The devout worshipped the box, following any order it gave, and in return they were filled with an emotion that could be only described as divine. 
As World War II rages on in Europe, the Foundation sends agents to recover anomalies in Mexico that might help with the war effort. While there, the Foundation force is tasked with learning about the Church of the Broken God. They are also ordered to investigate a town near La Paz, where there are troubling accounts of a mechanical anomalous creature causing mayhem. The agents make their way through Mexico, gathering various objects to bring back to Foundation sites in the United States. The unit loads all of the anomalies they recovered onto a train, with a plan to check out the stories of the mechanical anomaly they've heard about as they make their way to the U.S. border. The train heads north along rusted rails. Just outside La Paz, they've come across a broken-down train filled with what looks to be refugees. When the Foundation unit goes to investigate, they find all of the refugees repeating the same words over and over again, but they don't understand. The Foundation agents look at one another confused, until one of them translates the words into English. The words the refugees are saying over and over again are, La Machina, the machine. The commanding officer orders a squad of Foundation agents to proceed up the tracks, to see if they can figure out what has the refugees so scared. They make their way towards La Paz, disappearing over the horizon. As the sun sets, the remaining Foundation agents hear gunshots in the distance. They stay awake all night, remaining vigilant, waiting for the exploratory squad, but morning comes without anyone returning. Three days later, the Foundation Force still has not seen anything since the exploratory squad left. Then, as the sun sits lazily in the morning sky, a lone figure is spotted walking down the tracks towards the trains. One of the agents on watch blows his whistle and points to the figure. A squad of agents rushes towards the shadow of a man. Their guns are raised, ready for anything. The figure drops to the ground and begins to crawl along the tracks. The agents reach the fallen man, only to find that he is one of their squad mates who has been sent up the tracks to investigate La Paz several days before. The agent's name is DeMarco. He is covered in blood. His clothes are in tatters and he has lost a boot. DeMarco lies on his back with Foundation agents standing around him. His eyes are wide and wild. He keeps babbling on about a world eater, how the rest of his squad had been mulched, and he is the only one who made it out alive. The Foundation agents carry DeMarco back to the makeshift base they created by the trains. They need to figure out a way to get the convoy moving again, but whatever is up ahead has already taken out an entire Foundation squad. It had to be something anomalous, but what could it possibly be? The unit of Foundation agents prepare to move towards La Paz. They start loading their rifles and check the amount of ammunition and explosives available in case the containment process gets out of hand. Just as they are about to leave the base, a convoy appears on the horizon. It is an allied occult initiative force preparing to attack whatever it is that is devastating La Paz. This organization's mission is to not secure, contain, or protect, but to destroy. The Foundation may be in over their heads on this one, and the joint force with the Allied Occult Initiative may be the only way to stop what is now known as SCP-001. The AOI and Foundation force gears up for battle. They set out for La Paz, and what they find causes them to quake with fear. SCP-001 has consumed so much material, it is the size of a mountain. It moves like a tidal wave of mechanical destruction, washing over the buildings and landscape under it. Whatever SCP-001 passes over is consumed and added to its massive body. SCP-001 started as a small mechanical box with cogs, but now has morphed into a gigantic metal death machine. The Church of the Broken God has finally met their maker, as the small entity they once worshipped has now consumed all of its members. Their god is an all-consuming monster. The AOI and Foundation forces do everything they can to stop SCP-001 from continuing its reign of destruction. They fire barrage after barrage of bullets and explosives into the mechanical anomaly. They bring in air support to try and damage it from the skies, but nothing works. The AOI uses an artifact in their possession to lure SCP-001 to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, where a trap has been set for the so-called god. The monstrous mechanical creature moves slowly towards the water. It consumes abandoned cars, buildings, and boats as it approaches the coastline. It even shovels large amounts of earth into its form, causing flames to spurt out from its inner workings. Smoke bellows from openings between different mechanical components, like a volcano before it is about to erupt. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, a massive cloud with a reddish tint appears in the sky. Air raid sirens can be heard in the distance. The enormous cloud begins to pulsate. Streaks of lightning shoot through the red mist in the sky, 
It now sits directly over SCP-001. From within the cloud, part of a ship can be seen. It appears to be slightly damaged. Electricity flows over its hull. The vessel in the giant red cloud is classified as SCP-2399. The underside of the vessel begins to glow aqua blue. A blinding beam of light is ejected from SCP-2399, which penetrates straight down and through SCP-001. For a moment, everything is still. There is complete silence. Then, as if SCP-001 is trying to reach up and grab the vessel above it, a mechanical bulge reaches out. Before SCP-001 can grab the vessel above, there is another bright flash of light. SCP-2399 blinks out of existence. The sound of grinding gears can be heard coming from within SCP-001. It begins to shed its outer layers of metal. Then, the entire structure that was SCP-001 collapses into the water and onto the beach. Giant cogs fall from the sky. Parts of vehicles embed themselves in the sand. As the Foundation and AOI agents approach the piles of scrap metal and mechanical components, they see that some of them are still moving. It is as if an invisible power source is still pulsating through some of the machinery. The agents of the Foundation celebrate the destruction of the giant mechanical beast, but little do they know this was only a piece of the entity worshipped as the Broken God. The Foundation agents collect as many of the still-moving parts as they can. They find spinning gears, twitching pulleys, and firing pistons. As the parts are separated from one another and carried away from the main wreckage of SCP-001, they slowly stop moving and become inactive. Some of the artifacts recovered were identified as being connected to the Church of the Broken God. These artifacts are found closer to the middle of what was once a mountain-sized SCP-001. Hundreds of anomalous artifacts are collected and transported to SCP Foundation sites. Collecting the broken parts of SCP-001 is relatively safe. However, some agents get too close to the larger moving parts, getting caught in them and losing a body part or two. But most agents proceed with caution and survive the collection ordeal with their arms and legs still attached to their bodies. Dive teams are sent into the water to recover parts that have sunk to the bottom of the sea. One of the divers is a local from the area. He is hired to bring up the heart of the machine, since he is an experienced diver used to freediving to great depths to collect oysters from the bottom of the bay. The diver enters the water and swims down into the murky depths. He secures straps around the heart of SCP-001 and pulls hard on the rope, as an indication to the surface that it is ready to be hauled up. The salvage team on the surface begins to pull. There is a second slight tug on the rope, then it goes slack. The team continues to pull. When they get the heart to the surface, they are horrified at what else comes up with it. Tangled in the ropes is the lifeless body of the diver. His head is smashed between two moving pieces of the heart. It looks as if he shoved his head between the slabs of metal himself. The salvage team untangles the body, rolls it off the deck, and back into the ocean. The mechanical box which was the heart of SCP-001 is offloaded on the shore, but as the Foundation prepares to move it to a containment facility, the weather starts to deteriorate. Hurricane-force wind sweeps across the water and batter the coast. The heart is kept in a secured storage warehouse until it can be moved. The people living in the village nearby complain of hearing voices and rashes so itchy that they practically tear their skin off. Once the storm passes, the Foundation agents load the heart onto a ship, it is to be transported to a Foundation site just across the border. The ocean seems calm and serene. The Foundation ship undocks and begins its journey up the coast. Not too long after beginning its journey, the ship slowly drifts off course. It is as if the crew has stopped manning their posts, and the ship is being controlled by a mind of its own. The Foundation ship crashes and sinks somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, never to be found. And most importantly, the heart of SCP-001 doesn't make it to the Foundation site. Years later, a man is walking along the beach. He hears something. It sounds like someone pounding on a large drum to the rhythm of a heartbeat. The man walks towards the sound. Something is drawing him forward, closer and closer to the heartbeat. He walks and walks until the beating stops. He bends down and moves the sand aside. He spots the corner of a mechanical box sticking out of the white sand. The man digs deeper and pulls out the small box. Inside, he can see gears whirling and pistons firing. He holds the box close to his own heart. It seems to speak to him. The man brings the box back to town. He starts to worship the box, and soon more and more people in the area join the new religion. They cast aside their own beliefs and focus on the powerful entity contained within the box. 
God is not dead, at least not yet. But the prophecies of the Church of the Broken God say that when the heart is found, the God will reassemble itself once again. Then the unbroken God will destroy all other false deities, until only He remains. It's a quiet evening at Area 11 where the Pietrakau Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array is housed. A skeleton crew is working overnight to ensure the array is ready for its big test the following day. The Foundation has been working on a particle accelerator that will contain anomalies with the ability to manipulate the nature of space-time. The preliminary tests seem promising, but a few last-minute tweaks to the array are necessary. Unfortunately, it is on this night in 1982 that marks the beginning of the end for the SCP Foundation. Dr. Calvin Desman is monitoring the array, and he notices as it spools up that there are some minor power fluctuation in one of the stabilization arms. This problem is not uncommon, due to the vast amounts of energy being pumped through the array and the harmonic resonance the machine gives off, which slowly causes the coupling rings to loosen. Calvin Desmet decides that remounting the stabilization rings will be an easy fix, and it's a necessary one. He knows that if the rings fail during the actual test, the array could end up shut down for months. There is still plenty of time, so Calvin Desmond grabs his toolbox and heads down to the array. The machine is still spooling, keeping the energy flowing at a constant low rate. There is no danger at the moment, as the inside of the array is shielded from the radiation and energy pulsing through the outer ring. But then, something unexpected happens. The system's primary generator begins to fluctuate uncontrollably. A catastrophic failure is imminent. Sirens begin to sound, the facility is evacuated, and the chamber is sealed. Deep in the bowels of the array, Calvin Desmond cannot hear the evacuation announcement. The humming of the array echoes through the chamber, dampening all sound from the outside world. The array begins to come online while Desmond continues to work on the coupling. He has no idea what is about to happen. Meanwhile, a team of Foundation scientists scramble to get the power fluctuations in the main generator under control. As they frantically work, catastrophe strikes. They initiate the power down cycle, but as the generator struggles to keep the power flow balanced, an energy surge builds up. A massive amount of energy is released all at once, causing the main reactor to explode. The entire structure rocks back and forth, and Desmond is thrown into the side of the array. He too now knows that something is very wrong, and runs for the exit. When he reaches the door, he finds that it has been sealed. In a panic, Desmond continues running through the tube to the next access point. This door has been locked as well. He's never been so scared in his entire life and he shakes uncontrollably from the adrenaline being dumped into his muscles. The surge of energy rushes through the array towards Desmond. A singularity begins to form in the containment chamber. The array is working just as it should, except that there was never supposed to be a person inside as the singularity was brought into existence. Moments after the singularity forms, the massive pull of its gravity causes the stabilizer arm that Desmond had been working on to fail. The side of the array is ripped off and Calvin Desmet stares into the naked eye of the Singularity. Everything is silent and still for a moment. Then the Singularity collapses in on itself, taking the test chamber and much of the research wing with it, along with Dr. Calvin Desmet. Sparking wires hang from the exposed walls and ceiling where the Singularity ripped the main structure away. Water flows into the deep hole carved out of the earth where the array once stood. The scientists from Area 11 look into the crater left by the collapsed singularity. The Foundation Administration sends agents to collect the staff at the site and document the failings of the project. They conclude that the accident was caused by human error. They order the array to be rebuilt, this time using entirely automated systems to eliminate the chances of another mishap occurring. Several years after the catastrophic events at Area 11, a new array is constructed. An intelligence system called NetZack is put in charge of overseeing its functions. It is a supercomputer that is programmed to follow commands, but can autonomously make decisions in order to prevent any failures in the system. Experiments begin again in May of 2006. The new array soon manifests its first singularity in the containment chamber at Area 11, and what happens next will forever change the Foundation and the multiverse. The singularity is kept stable in the array, it seems as if the Foundation has succeeded in trapping and containing spatial anomalies. But as they run more diagnostics on the anomaly, 
something unexpected happens. The singularity begins to grow in size. The point of infinite gravity threatens to breach containment as it reaches the boundaries of the array. Just before contact, the singularity's growth slows and then stops. Netzak has made the split-second calculations and adjustments necessary to contain the singularity. The artificial intelligence has saved the facility and the lives of everyone in it. Now, sitting in the array, is a thick, rotating cloud of radioactive gas and dust, obscuring the singularity within. As Foundation scientists work rapidly to fix the array, odd events begin to occur. The workers hear noises that sound like painful wailing. Over time, the noises evolve into words, and then full sentences. They seem to be originating from the singularity. Using equipment able to penetrate the thick cloud of radioactive gas, the Foundation scientists get a glimpse at the singularity. To their surprise, the singularity has taken on the shape of a human. The scientists work frantically to figure out how the singularity could have formed itself into a humanoid shape. Dr. J. Barton Ramsey is the first to try and make contact with the humanoid within the singularity. He finds that the entity cannot communicate in the traditional sense. The massive gravitational pull of the singularity does not allow sound to escape its void. Instead, the entity manipulates gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array itself and create sound waves. The being in the singularity whispers in a metallic voice created by the vibrating of the array's rings and says, Johannes Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey steps back from the observation window. How do you know my name? He asks the entity. The humanoid within the swirling gas cloud identifies itself as having the memories of Calvin Desmond. It is not Desmond per se. The being in the singularity is so much more than one person. But it was somehow created by the accident that had sucked Calvin Desmond into the singularity years before. The entity seems to switch between the mind of Desmond and the vast infinity of the cosmos. The Desmond entity asks for an overseer from the Foundation to be brought in. It has a proposal for the O5 Council. When Dr. Ramsey asks why the entity needs to talk to the overseers, it replies that it wants to offer them a way out. The following day, O51 enters the facility and heads to the observation deck. He looks through the reinforced glass at the swirling cloud of radioactive dust then glances at the monitor to see the humanoid shape of the singularity within. He presses the microphone button on the console and addresses the entity. To whom am I speaking? He asks. For simplicity's sake, the entity tells O5-1 to refer to him as Calvin Desmond. O5-1 makes notes of the events unfolding before him and then asks about the way out that Calvin had mentioned. The air is still for a moment. Then, Desmond begins to speak through the vibration of the structure once again. He informs O5-1 that what the SCP Foundation is doing by securing and containing anomalous entities around the world is like putting a small band-aid on a much bigger wound. Desmond wants to propose a final solution to all of the Foundation's problems. O5-1 listens intently as the entity unravels the mysteries of where the SCPs have come from. He explains that the anomalies that the Foundation has worked so hard to secure, contain, and protect the human race from are actually bleeding into their reality from a vast multiverse. The only way to stop the manifestation of anomalies into this universe is to destroy all other realities. The entity that is Calvin Desmond tells O5-1 that he is able to bring about this destruction if they release him from the confines of the array. O5-1 is transfixed by the swirling gas that is promising him and everyone else on Earth salvation. He shakes his head in disbelief. Could this be true? O5-1 turns away from the swirling gas and begins to walk away from the viewing glass. I'll need to think about what you're saying. The structure begins to shake slightly. The voice of Calvin Desmond reverberates off of the array a little louder than before. Choose quickly, Overseer. Although it won't happen for decades, eventually a catastrophic SCP event will wipe out life on this planet. Perhaps not in your lifetime, but it will most certainly happen within the lifetime of your children. We will talk again soon. The vibrations slow and then stop completely. There is an eerie stillness in the observation room as O5-1 walks out. The next day, all staff members located at Area 11 are relocated to other Foundation sites and given amnestics. The O5 Council meets in a large circular room with wood paneling and no windows. 
05-1 begins the meeting by telling the others what Calvin Desmond had described about the end of the world. He pauses for what seems like an eternity and tells them of Desmond's offer that he could prevent the end of the world, but at the cost of destroying an infinite number of other realities. This would mean that all the humans and creatures of those realities would be destroyed as well. Was murdering countless other beings worth it to protect their own reality? 05-1 begins to shake. He hasn't slept or eaten anything since his talk with Desmond. He's being torn apart from the inside. 05-3 stands up and addresses the council. He informs everyone in the room that independent teams have concluded research into what the Calvin Desmond entity has claimed, and they found it to be true. The world really would come to an end. Furthermore, the research teams determined that the capabilities of Desmond would in fact allow him to dismantle the other realities. 05-3 insists that the Council must vote to allow Desmond to destroy the other realities to ensure that this reality could be saved. They must strike now before the world is overrun. 05-1 continues to shake while 05-3 breathes heavily, sweat pouring down his temples. The rest of the Council shifts their gazes from side to side. It is time for a vote. There are eight eyes to allow Desmond to destroy all other realities and four nays against the plan. 05-3 stands up and walks around the room, stopping behind each nay voter and putting a bullet in their head. He stops at the last, 05-9, who pulls out a gun, places it under her own chin, and pulls the trigger. 05-13 abstains from the vote and the measure passes. The remaining overseers will use the Calvin Desmond entity to save their reality at the expense of all others, and they soon head to Area 11 to execute their plan. 05-1, 4, and 12 enter the observation room that looks upon the swirling radioactive gas around Calvin Desmond. 05-1 orders Netzak to begin powering down the array which will allow the entity to prove he can do what he has promised. They have pinpointed the reality that SCP-884 came from, and the shaving mirror itself sits on a table in another room in the facility. 05-3 stands in the room, watching the mirror to see if anything happens. 05-1 asks Calvin Desmond to eliminate the reality that the mirror had come from. The room shakes as the entity uses it to acknowledge the request. Moments later, the phone rings in the observation room. It is 05-3. He informs the others that the mirror has disappeared. Its reality has been destroyed, and therefore, it no longer exists. There is a sigh of relief in the room as the overseers realize that this just might work. 05-1 asks Calvin Desmond to continue and destroy all the realities that are bleeding into their own. This time, the entire facility begins to quake. Suddenly, 05-1 jerks backwards. His eyes wide in confusion and horror. His body seems to be compressing under an unknown force. 05-1 begins to distort. His legs and arms fold into the core of his body. His head snaps down, and all that was 05-1 is sucked down into a single point in space before it completely disappears. Calvin Desmond then turns his attention to the other two overseers in the room, who both seem to collapse into black holes of their own in the center of their bodies. Netzak's warning klaxon begins to sound, signaling that the emergency failsafe has been activated. Before Calvin Desmond is brought under control, the structural support in the entire facility vibrates with his words. They are in a voice that sounds strangely similar to 051's. Your children are free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The Foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. It had been a deception. The Calvin Desmond entity had no intention of stopping anomalies from infiltrating this world. It wanted to remove all traces of the anomalies from all universes, including this one and that meant destroying the Overseers and the Foundation itself. Their destruction would serve as an atonement for the pain and suffering they had caused in their quest to secure and contain the Anomalous. Calvin had to lie to the Overseers about the real plan, since he knew they'd never sacrifice themselves and the Foundation, even if it meant an end to the Anomalies plaguing our world. Now though, 
With the overseers out of the way, the Calvin Desmond entity is free to move forward with its plan and purge all realities of any trace of the anomalous. But just then, Netsack's failsafes kick in and the Petrical Fountain Spatial Stabilization Array subdues the entity's abilities. Desmet is once again contained. O5-3 bursts through the door and into the observation room. He stands before the shattered glass of the window that looks into the array. O5-3 asks Netsack how long the containment array can hold Calvin Desmet. The computer's voice fades in and out, but says, Given current conditions, 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. O5-3 sighs. He tells Netzak to make a node in the SCP database that the Calvin Desmet entity will now be known as SCP-001. Then to make dozens of other randomly generated entries and label them as SCP-001 as well. He knows that they will need to keep the true nature of what this entity can do a secret. O5-3 walks out of the room. Under his breath, he speaks to himself. They'll say that I'll know the one true god when I see it, and to give that god everything it wants, because that's the only thing that matters. Tonight, it appears god wants to talk to me. Calvin Lucian stands at the end of a dusty table in an abandoned warehouse. In the shadows across from him sits several hidden figures. The warehouse is falling apart but is suitable for the meeting Calvin has requested with the heads of the Chaos Insurgency. He has completed numerous missions for the organization, and each one has been successful. Now he is proposing one final mission. Calvin Lucian takes a tattered journal out of his bag and slides it across the table to the figures sitting in the shadows. It's a journal, with details on the habits of each of the 13 Foundation Overseers, he says. There is silence from the other end of the table. A hand reaches out and grabs the journal. The pages begin to turn. The new models indicate an anomalous catastrophe is imminent. Not even the Foundation can stop it. The only way to save the world is to kill the Overseers. There are whispers from across the table as Calvin continues. The proliferation of anomalies in the world are the fault of the Overseers. They have been meddling with reality. If business continues as usual, we might not make it out of the 2020s. We need to act now. The whispering from the shadows resumes this time with what seems to be a little more urgency. One of the voices asks the question on everyone's mind. How do you plan to kill the Overseers? They have a deal with death. They are immortal. Calvin smiles and takes out a small vial from his jacket pocket. With this, he says, there is a silence from the shadows. The journal slides back across the table and comes to a stop right in front of Calvin. A deep voice from the shadows says, Do it. Calvin Lucian gathers his team. The codename given to the group is Kill Squad. He informs them that they've been cleared to take out the Overseers. It will be the most dangerous mission they've ever been on, and even if successful, they probably won't make it out alive. But the team is loyal. They set out to confront the 13th Overseer. This has to be their first stop because without eliminating O5-13, nothing else will matter. It is this Overseer who has a deal with death, a deal that protects all of the Foundation Overseers from dying. If that deal can be broken, then Calvin Lucian and his team will have a shot at eradicating the other Overseers. If the deal with death cannot be broken, all is lost. The team boards a ship at the tip of South America and sails towards the frozen waters of Antarctica. The kill squad is made up of Calvin and three others. They sit in the galley preparing for the mission ahead. Anthony Wright is a battle-hardened soldier who sits at one end of the table. His face is covered with scars. No one can remember when he first joined the insurgency, because it was so long ago. Next to him is Olivia Torres. She is an anarchist who was recruited into the insurgency after she was liberated from a Foundation site during a raid. Adam Ivanov sits staring into his computer screen. He is testing different gadgets that might be of use on the mission. He pushes his glasses up the bridge of his nose and strikes the enter key. A long line of code begins to scroll across the screen. A siren begins to sound, informing the crew to make their way to the main deck. When they surface from the bowels of the ship, they see something in the distance. It is a giant black tower rising from the depths of the ocean like an evil iceberg. Waves crash over the side of the railings, drenching the deck and crew with frigid water. Calvin looks at the jagged rocks along the shore of the tower. There is no way to safely dock. There is only one way onto the island. They know what needs to be done. Anthony waits for the next wave. 
then opens the throttle to full. The ship is carried towards the island on the crest of the wave. The hull is impaled on the rocks surrounding the tower, sending everything flying towards the front of the boat. See? That wasn't so bad, Calvin says to his team as he bandages a gash on his hand. Knowing what lays ahead, Calvin orders his team to wait on the ship while he makes his own deal with death. He enters the dark structure and is greeted by a corpse. The corpse speaks to him, ejecting dust from its lungs with every word. Its breath smells like decaying flesh. Death has inhabited the body of Dr. Felix Carter, the 13th Overseer. Calvin is prepared, though thanks to the notes in the journal he possesses. Without hesitating, he takes out a small bottle of liquid from his pocket and lunges at the corpse. He grabs it by the neck, tilts the head back, and pours liquid down what is left of the throat of Felix Carter. The corpse reanimates into the living Dr. Carter. Death has been removed from his body by liquid from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin had acquired on a previous raid on a Foundation site. Seeing that Dr. Carter is now alive, Calvin takes out his pistol and shoots the doctor twice, killing him. Calvin picks up the body and throws it into a bottomless pit at the base of the tower. Dr. Felix Carter's body disappears from sight. The Overseer's deal with death is now broken. They are vulnerable and can be killed at last. Calvin smiles and begins to turn away from the pit when he comes face to face with death. She stands with her head cocked to the side looking at Calvin. So it is you who has broken the Overseer's deal with me, Calvin Lucian. Calvin takes a step back. Why didn't she stop him from killing Felix Carter? Something festers at the heart of the council, Death says. Something that will not die. I thought that perhaps if I had a seat at their table, I could find it, make it die. But I couldn't. There are things in this world beyond even my reach, Calvin Lucian. With that parting thought, Death vanishes. The kill squad contacts the insurgency for an evac and then makes their way to Japan, where 05-12, also known as the Accountant, has been working out of Tokyo. He is so proficient in mathematics and probability that he can actually predict the future. Everything about the Accountant's life, down to the number of breaths and steps he takes each day, is predetermined, based on his own statistical models. This poses a problem for Calvin and his team. If the Accountant can see them coming, then how can they possibly kill him? That night, the Accountant steps out of his car. He looks to the left and spots Adam. He has already predicted this man has hostile intentions. The accountant walks directly towards Adam and before he can react, throws the kill squad member to the ground. Then he turns slightly and adjusts his watch, sending a glare directly into the window where Anthony has the accountant in his sights of his sniper rifle. Anthony fires, but misses due to being blinded by the glare. The accountant is surprised that he just barely had time to avoid being shot. Normally, he would be several steps ahead of anyone trying to kill him. He turns his head and watches as Olivia helps Adam up and they run down a nearby alley. The accountant pursues them and corners the kill squad members in the alley. He pulls a gun to shoot Adam, but Olivia tackles Adam behind a dumpster as the bullet hits the wall directly behind where Adam was standing. The accountant can't believe that he missed and that he was almost tricked into being captured by the insurgency team. He senses uncertainty in his assailant's actions and runs away unable to predict exactly what they are planning to do. The accountant climbs the stairs to a subway station and boards the last car of the train. It is empty except for one man, Calvin Lucian. The accountant is dumbfounded. How are you here? He screams. I should have seen this coming. Calvin stands up. He uses his thumb to flip a coin into the air. On the way down, he grabs it and smacks it on the back of his opposing hand. Calvin smiles. The team has been making their decisions based on the flip of a coin, which introduced randomness into their actions that even this super advanced mathematician could not account for. Tell me where 05-11 is, demands Calvin. The accountant pauses, then shakes his head no. If he's going to die either way, then why give any information to the kill squad? Calvin flips the coin up in the air, catches it, and looks at it. The coin is face up. Calvin lifts his pistol and shoots the accountant in the head. A few nights later, Olivia stands on a balcony outside of an art exhibit overlooking the city of Seattle. Anthony walks up behind her and tells her that the Foundation is defeated, but Olivia doesn't understand how. We broke the Overseer's deal with death and killed the accountant. There's nothing more to do. We can go back to our normal lives, he tells her. Olivia is skeptical, though. What about the 11th Overseer and his ability to... Olivia's eyes suddenly go wide. She pulls out a knife and stabs it into Anthony's heart. The world around her begins to distort and fall apart. It was a false reality created by 05-11, better known as The Liar. Olivia wakes up next to Adam in a hotel room. She sits up in a bed and rubs her eyes. 
what a weird dream, she thinks. Then she realizes it wasn't a dream. She shakes Adam awake. Neither of them have any idea how they ended up here, but they know it must be the doing of the liar. They had planned for this, though. With Calvin having created a contingency plan, they pull out a laptop and log in to view the classified information Calvin left for them. Olivia begins to type but stops halfway through her password and looks up from the screen. Olivia pulls out the gun that rests under her pillow and shoots at him. The false reality created by the liar falls apart around her. Olivia comes out of the previous lie and is sitting across the table from Calvin. She immediately draws her pistol and points it at Calvin's head. Is it really him? Or just another one of the liar's games? Calvin tries to talk Olivia down and she looks around the room for inconsistencies that might tip her off that this is another lie, but doesn't find any. Olivia begins to relax. She tells Calvin that the liar is trying to get something from her. Maybe the journal can tell them what he is looking for, as long as she still has it. Olivia nods her head and holds out her wrist where a subdermal chip with a copy of the journal on it has been placed. Calvin looks at her wrist. The world around them begins to dissipate as Calvin morphs into the liar. Olivia wakes up in a hospital where she is hooked up to an IV. Sitting across from her is a former insurgency agent named Sam Beale. He explains to her that he is the liar. He was forced into becoming a monster by the Foundation. They had manipulated him, but now he is tired of running and can't do it anymore. She is free to go. Olivia hesitantly unhooks herself from the IV. She walks out of the hospital room and proceeds down a fluorescent lit hallway. As she walks away, she hears a gunshot from the hospital room. As Olivia is in the hospital, Calvin and Adam walk through a dense forest. They are searching for 05-10. The journal indicates that the 10th Overseer's identity within the Foundation is the Archivist. In the middle of the clearing are two saplings standing side by side. The void between the saplings shimmers. Calvin walks through the portal and the space begins to warp and twist around him. His vision finally comes back into focus and Calvin finds himself in another world. Adam enters the world behind Calvin, practically knocking him over as he enters through the portal. This is the Wanderer's Library, but it doesn't look anything like they expected. Instead of rows of books, the library is filled with computer mainframes, humming with the collected knowledge of how to contain anomalies, a critical backup. As the two look intently at the strange machines, a figure in a silver robe suddenly steps out of the darkness. It's tall and thin, and though its hood is pulled down so they can't see its face, they can see that its hands are covered in scales that have a slight emerald tint. It is one of the librarians. Calvin tells the librarian that they are seeking the archivist, but the librarian tells them that the archivist is no longer in the library. She has broken her pact with the serpent and eaten fruit from the forbidden trees. If they want to see her, though, the librarian can take them to her. Calvin and Adam follow the librarian down a long staircase, passing by countless doors filled with books, scrolls, works of art, an entire universe of knowledge. Eventually, they reach the bottom of the stairs where there stands a giant set of brass doors. Beyond the door, the librarian explains, is the source of all knowledge. Before Calvin and Adam pass through the doors, though, Calvin turns to the librarian. Before we go in, I'd like to make a withdrawal, he says. The librarian nods and pulls out a silver tube out of its robe. It hands the tube to Adam, and he looks it over in his hands. He looks up to ask what this is, but the librarian has vanished. The door then opens, and the two step through. Calvin and Adam feel as if they walk through the same kind of portal that brought them to the library, and find that they have walked into a lush green valley with two trees. Sitting underneath one of them is a woman in a white dress. She is reading a book and eating a piece of fruit. Are you the archivist? Calvin asks. The woman nods yes, and that's all the confirmation Calvin needs. He raises his pistol and fires, but the bullet passes right through the archivist as if she wasn't there. Do you read? The archivist asks Calvin, seemingly not phased by his attempts to shoot her. I haven't had much time recently, Calvin replied. The archivist explains that she's read every book in the library. The collected knowledge of the universe is in the books, even one on how to allow bullets to pass through your body. She came here to find the secret to immortality. It's her job to document everything that happens in the world, and she can't do that if she's dead. 
She explains that she figured out that the fruit that the serpent forbade everyone to eat wasn't actual fruit, but the knowledge contained in the library. By having read every book, she has consumed the fruit. She no longer needs the serpent, because she was the serpent. The archivist falls to the ground and begins to writhe around, contorting her body as it starts to change. She begins to elongate as her limbs seemingly disappear. The next thing Calvin and Adam know, they are face to face with a giant snake. Calvin dodges as the serpent lunges at him and Adam stands in the doorway, firing at the snake with his pistol. But just like with the archivist's human form, the bullets have no effect. The serpent coils around Calvin and begins to choke the life from him as Adam can only watch helpless. Calvin cries out with his last breath. The tube, Adam! Open the tube! Adam takes the tube that was given to him by the librarian and opens the cap. A long, heavy spear slides out that looks much too large to have ever fit inside. He drops the tube to the ground and watches in amazement as it starts to transform, turning into what looks like a large harpoon gun. Adam knows what to do and places the giant spear into the gun and points it at the serpent. You can't kill me, the giant snake says. I've eaten from the tree of life. Adam pulls the trigger and the huge spear flies through the air, striking the serpent in the head. Adam runs to Calvin and helps him to his feet. They turn to look at the snake, but instead of the menacing creature, it's the archivist once again, pinned against the tree she once sat under, the spear sticking out of her skull. As the two stand, looking at the archivist, a tall, hooded, humanoid figure steps out from behind the tree. It looks similar to the librarian, except its robe is a greenish color and it wears long black gloves. The creature pulls the spear out of the archivist, whose body slumps to the ground and hands the spear to Calvin. Who are you? Calvin asks, but his question is ignored. After a moment, the figure finally speaks. That spear you now hold is called the Spear of the Non-Believer. It is an ancient weapon used to kill gods. It is odd that someone in this realm gave you the spear. Even with it, I am not sure you will be able to complete your quest, Calvin Lucian. But we shall see. There is a sudden flash of light, and Calvin and Adam find themselves transported back to the forest they had entered the Wanderer's Library from. A week later, Calvin and Anthony track down O5-9, who in the council is known as the Outsider. She isn't hard to find, and it seems as if she actually wanted to be found. They find her sitting outside of her burnt-down family home. The journal had listed this as her address, but Calvin doubted that she would be here, and most he hoped to find a clue to her whereabouts. But here she was, sitting in the ashes of her home. Without turning around, the Outsider began speaking. The council just used me, you know, she says. They took away my academic career, my friends, and my life. They made me conduct research for them that compromised everything I stood for, and now here I am with nothing. The outsider lets out a sigh. She asks Calvin if he's afraid of death. Calvin shakes his head and responds, No. The outsider slumps forward and Calvin walks around to face her. She is covered in blood. Her eyes move to look up at Calvin. You're lying, she says, as she dies from self-inflicted wounds. Calvin and Anthony cross 05-9 off the list and head back to the car. As they walk, Anthony says what's been on everyone's minds the last few days. The easy part is done. We'll only get harder from here. We know 05-8 is in his castle. I'm sure we'll get in, but I'm not sure if we'll make it out alive. I know, replies Calvin. But if we're going to save the world, we must eliminate the rest of the overseers, even if it means sacrificing our own lives. They get in the car and drive off into the blood-red sunset to pick up the rest of the Kill Squad team before their next mission. Calvin Lucian leads the Kill Squad team through the mud and freezing rain. In front of them looms the fortress of Baron Lehman Hoadley, the eighth overseer. The team has already been through a lot, from breaking the overseer council's deal with death by eliminating 05-13, to using the spear of the non-believer to kill the godlike archivist, 05-10. The hunting of overseers has taken a toll on the kill squad. 05-12 almost killed Adam, and Olivia was stuck in what seemed like an endless mind game with 05-11. The first five overseers were eliminated, but the words that the ninth overseer spoke to Calvin Lucian before she died still run through his mind. Are you afraid of death? Now the Kill Squad is about to infiltrate one of the most heavily guarded facilities in the world to eliminate the eighth overseer. Upon reaching the castle, 
The team is surprised to find the structure is in ruin. No one is supposed to know the location of 05-8 though. The fortress was supposed to be practically impregnable. They storm the castle of 05-8 all the same. The journal Calvin possesses that contains information about the members of the SCP Foundation's powerful 05 Council identifies him as a former industrialist named Baron Lehman Hoadley. With his vast wealth, Hoadley funded the Foundation at the start and was considered the unofficial leader of the Council in its early days with immense control over the actions of the organization. The Kill Squad makes their way through the dimly lit hallways of the castle. As they turn the corner, they are surprised to find the charred remains of Baron Lehman Hoadley's bodyguards. It seems that someone or something has gotten to Hoadley before they could. The team makes their way to the main chamber and breaches the door. Laying by a still lit fireplace is 05-8. The kill squad scans the room to make sure the killer isn't still in there with them. Adam walks over to the body and examines it. He quickly realizes that Hoadley hasn't been murdered at all. He sees that Baron Hoadley's body has been drastically modified using anomalous technology. The overseer used his immortality to modify almost every part of his body to make himself stronger. Unfortunately for Baron Hoadley, when the overseer's deal with death was broken by Calvin, the modifications to his body slowly tore him apart. His regular body could no longer support all of the modifications, and what once made him practically invincible became the very thing that destroyed him. The team leaves the castle and crosses 05-8 off their list. On their way out, Adam pulls Calvin aside. He has the feeling that Anthony hasn't been completely honest with the rest of the team. He had the feeling that Anthony was hiding something from them. Calvin had similar thoughts recently. He pushes Anthony for more information about his past, and Anthony reveals that he's over 100 years old. The vial of water from the Fountain of Youth that Calvin has was not the only one. Early in his career with the insurgency, he had confiscated other vials from a Foundation site. His squad drank the water and it extended their lives. He asks Calvin on what he plans on doing with his water from the Fountain. I'm going to destroy it, Calvin tells him. Anthony agrees with this plan. Once you drink from the Fountain of Youth, you may extend your life, but a part of you dies at the same time. Vibrancy of the senses disappears, leading to a seemingly shallow life. If Anthony could go back and do it again, he never would have drank the water. Calvin receives intel from the insurgency that the seventh overseer is in a small town in Cambodia. The kill squad makes their way to the village and surveys the area, hoping to get a glimpse at the overseer who is codenamed Green. As the team conducts reconnaissance, Anthony tells them that he thinks the mission is a setup. It is too remote, and there are so many unknown variables. But Calvin is convinced that this might be their only chance to kill Green. Since Green arrived in the area, there has been non-stop chaos. She has destabilized the local governments, and now the area is in an all-out war. The team weaves through narrow passageways between houses and buildings, trying to make their way to the central compound where Green is located. Suddenly, a mob starts to form. They are getting closer and closer to the team. In a quick decision to avoid being seen, Calvin orders everyone into a nearby building. Before Anthony can follow, the mob rounds the corner. They spot Anthony, and he's forced to flee. Calvin, Olivia, and Adam watch as the mob chases after Anthony, but they have to keep moving. Calvin knows that Anthony can take care of himself, and they are too close to their goal to stop now. Calvin slowly opens the front door of the house they are hiding in and peers out. The coast looks clear, so he signals Olivia and Adam to follow him. Before they can step out into the street, a gas canister enters through a cracked doorway. The room fills with sleeping gas and the team passes out. When they are awake, they are tied up in a large room with marble vaulted ceilings. 05-7 is standing in front of Calvin. She smiles wickedly while holding a knife. She compliments Calvin on what he and his team have been able to do so far. No one believed they could pull off even a fraction of what they have. But now she has an offer for Calvin. She points towards Adam and Olivia and tells Calvin he must choose one of them to die. If he doesn't, she'll kill the leader of the rioters and plunge another part of the country into chaos. Screw you, is Calvin's response. Very well, utters Green. Have it your way. She assassinates the leader being held in her compound, then turns back to Calvin. She now threatens to torture his team until Calvin makes a choice of who to kill. Green slashes Adam's cheek with her knife as Calvin screams for Green to leave his team alone and torture him instead. 
Green just smiles. I'm going to enjoy killing your friends while you watch, as you have killed so many of my overseers on the council. She reaches up in the air with the knife above Adam's head. Before she can plunge the knife through his skull, a bullet passes through her hand, causing her to drop the knife. Anthony kneels on a rooftop across the courtyard, smoking sniper rifles still pointed at Green, who runs. Calvin uses the drop knife to cut his ropes and chases after Green. He follows her to the roof where he watches as she boards a helicopter. The aircraft lifts off as Anthony fires at it from his original position, but does no serious damage. In the plaza below, the mob that has separated the team earlier becomes restless. There is complete chaos and someone fires a rocket at the fleeing helicopter. The rocket hits the tail of the aircraft, sending it crashing into the plaza full of rioters below as the crowd flees from the scene. Calvin makes his way towards the wreckage and reaches it at the same time Anthony does. Calvin looks at him, smiles, and thanks him for saving his life. Anthony smiles back, but before he can say anything, a gunshot rings out and a bullet rips through his neck. Calvin turns to see where it came from and is horrified to see the burning body of 05-7. Her skin has been charred black, but in her burnt hand she holds a gun. What's left of her lips curl back in a sinister grin as she fires again and hits Anthony in the chest. He falls to the ground. Calvin runs to him and pulls out his gun to shoot 05-7, but she is already dead. Calvin holds his dying teammate as blood pours out of his neck and chest, but Calvin can stop this. He pulls out the vial of water from the fountain. No, winces Anthony, I have lived long enough. Thank you, my friend. I will see you in whatever lies beyond this life. Anthony's chest rises, then falls. It does not rise again. Olivia and Adam round the corner to see Calvin holding the lifeless body of their teammate, tears flowing from his eyes. The team holds a small ceremony and burial for Anthony, but are only halfway through their mission and can't stop now. They fly back to the United States, where an undercover insurgency agent named Kowalski informs them that 05-6 is already aware they are after him. This overseer is codenamed the American because he has the power of the entire US military at his fingertips. The kill squad scouts the base where the American is located. Kowalski warns them of a crate that was recently brought to the base from Site-19. The Americans showed great interest in whatever was in the container. The group sets up a camp on a hill overlooking the base. As the sun slowly rises the next day, the kill squad is spotted by a drone and forced to hop in their jeep and try to run. They make their way down the hill, finding themselves in the valley below with no clear exit. In front of them lands a helicopter as Humvees roar into the canyon behind them. The team is surrounded. A jeep pulls up and 05-6 steps out. He introduces himself as Rufus King, member of the Overseer Council, but an American citizen first and foremost. All he really wants is to protect the country he loves. Thanks to you, I've lost my immortality and can no longer effectively protect the United States anymore, the American says to Calvin. But I'm willing to make a deal. Your freedom for the spear of the non-believer. Rumor has it that you have the spear in your possession, and you used it to kill the archivist. If you give me the spear, I will let you go. No, replies Calvin. I will never give an overseer the means to cause more destruction. The spear stays with us. Very well, the American says with a frown. Then I suppose my only other option is to take it from you, but not without giving you a fair chance. Run, Calvin Lucian. Run as fast as you can. I will be coming for you. The American turns and walks towards the container from Site-19, which is being lowered from a helicopter hovering above them. Calvin sprints back to the jeep with the other members of his team. As they drive away, they hear a horrible, guttural screech from whatever was inside the container. After a few moments, the army begins to pursue them. Out in front of the military force is 05-6 riding SCP-682. He is using a black whip to urge the creature forward, and they're gaining on the kill squad. Fast. A row of vehicles pulls up beside the American and SCP-682. Then something strange happens. A man appears in front of the oncoming forces led by the American. The man's skin bulges and seems to be moving from within. The skin of the man slouses from his body. The infection that is SCP-610 erupts out of him and onto the soldiers in the nearby jeep. 
SCP-610 begins to infect and consume everyone around it. Suddenly, there are thousands of instances of SCP-610 coming from the mountainside, flooding into the valley. They close in and around the army and O5-6. The American begins fighting off the flesh-eating creatures from the back of SCP-682, but he becomes overwhelmed. He can no longer focus on pursuing Calvin and his team. From the back of the jeep, Olivia pulls out her rifle. She aims and fires. The bullet hits the American in the chest. He is flung off the back of SCP-682 and engulfed in a sea of SCP-610 creatures. The kill squad continues to drive, trying to put as much distance between themselves and the SCP-610 infestation as possible. But then Calvin suddenly slams on the brake. Standing in front of them is a man in a black suit and bow tie. He introduces himself as Blackbird, the fifth overseer. According to the journal, his actual name is Mortimer J. Denning von Krocknicker. He stands in front of the jeep with a menacing grin. You have been causing a lot of trouble, he says looking at Calvin. Olivia swings her gun around. Oh, please, my dear, that won't help you, von Krocknicker says. He pulls out a knife and stabs himself through the neck. He falls to the ground, apparently dead. There is a gust of wind a whiff of ozone, and an identical copy and still very much alive von Krocknicker lands next to his own dead body. See what I mean? He says. Olivia lowers her rifle. Come with me, I have something to show you. The blackbird beckons. Seeing no other option, Calvin, Olivia, and Adam exit the jeep and follow the blackbird. As they walk, the world changes around them. The desert mountains fade away into blackness and find themselves in the near-apocalyptic London. Oh, it's good to be home, the blackbird says as they emerge onto a cobblestone street. You cannot stop the overseer's plans. However, I can give you an alternative. Let's see if any of you will take it. In front of each kill squad member appears a door. They have an uncontrollable urge to open their respective door and walk through. The blackbird stands smiling as he watches Calvin, Olivia, and Adam enter each of their portals. Adam enters his door and looks around. He is in Portland. His parents walk into the room. In this universe, his family has been granted asylum. Adam never has to interact with any SCPs or the Foundation. He is free to live a normal life. From the kitchen comes Calvin wearing an apron. He is holding a steaming pot. Adam locks eyes with Calvin, who smiles at him. The blackbird whispers into Adam's ear. In this reality, both of your parents and siblings are still alive. Also, the man you love loves you back. You and Calvin could be married if you stayed here. Wouldn't that be nice? Olivia enters her door. She is on the deck of a yacht. At the bow sits an easel with art supplies. The man that Olivia once loved walks across the deck towards her. The blackbird looms over her. In this reality, you didn't accidentally kill him. This could be your happily ever after. Wouldn't that be nice? Calvin steps through his door. He is in a grassy clearing near a lake. The blackbird hisses in Calvin's ear. I'm giving you the opportunity to save your mother this time, Calvin. You were just a scared little boy. But in this reality, you can be brave. You can actually save your mother from her fate. No! Calvin screams. This isn't real! The blackbird cackles. Calvin looks away from the lake and towards the tree line. Hidden in the shadows, he can just barely make out a hooded figure. Calvin walks towards it. The blackbird follows. He is screaming at the person in the tree line. I was only trying to help! The hooded figure reaches out and hands Calvin a metal tube. He opens it to find a set of eyeglasses inside. Calvin puts them on and turns to look at the blackbird. He steps back in horror. The glasses have revealed the true form of the blackbird. He is a winged pseudo-avian monstrosity full of rage. The mysterious hooded figure directs Calvin to open the tube again. Inside is an interdimensional fishing line made by Dr. Wondertainment and a white wiffle ball bat. Calvin grabs the fishing line and wraps it around O5-5's leg. The blackbird flies into the air trying to get away from Calvin, but Calvin wraps the other end of the fishing line around his arm. The blackbird begins to jump from dimension to dimension trying to get rid of Calvin. They appear on the deck of SCP-455, in Site-19 where SCP-682 walks freely. In the dead world of SCP-2935, every time they stop in a new dimension, 
Calvin takes the opportunity to attack the Blackbird with the bat, and it seems that he is slowly weakening the monster. They finally land at the bottom of a deep well foundation containment site, where the dark body that is SCP-001 is contained. Standing in front of the containment field is Allison Cho, the Black Queen, whose sole mission is to destroy the Foundation. You! cries the Blackbird. You are the one who has been helping Lucian! The Black Queen nods her head. Yes, I have been helping Calvin Lucian to eliminate you and the other overseers. The Foundation must fall. You are nothing! You cannot stop me! I am the Black King! screams 05-5. Allison Chow sighs. She pushes a button on the panel next to her, shutting down the array containing the dark body. Out of the cloud of dust appears SCP-001, a massive black creature who seemed to absorb all light. No, stop! shrieks the blackbird. SCP-001 does not move, but the room begins to shake. The blackbird continues to scream as his body folds in on itself until he is reduced to a single superheated point and then blinks out of existence. Allison Chow then reactivates the containment array, sealing 001 away once again. I will return you to your reality along with your friends, says the Black Queen, but perhaps our paths shall cross again, Calvin Lucian. There is a bright flash of light, and Calvin finds himself on a private jet sitting next to Olivia and Adam. They are all shaken, but the Blackbird is Whoa. dead. 05-5 has been eliminated. The three members of the team sit silently, <laughs> still pondering what might have been if they stayed in the alternate realities. Suddenly, the phone on the plane begins to ring, breaking the silence. Calvin picks it up. On the other line is the fourth overseer. He has contacted Calvin to discuss surrendering to the insurgency. Unfortunately, things do not always go as planned. Calvin Lucian is about to make the most difficult and dangerous decision of his life. Aaron Siegel, better known to Foundation members as O5-1, descends into the abyss of a deep well site. He exits the elevator and peers into the optical scanner to unlock the reinforced door. Inside the room is Mobile Task Force Tau-5, Samsara. Aaron Siegel refers to these immortal cyborg clones created from the flesh of a dead god as his red right hand. Your mission is to eliminate the traitor 05-4 and to find the insurgents who have been killing the members of the Overseer Council. The cyborgs stand at attention. Now, Aaron Siegel screams. The soldiers of the red right hand march out the door to start their mission. Aaron Siegel pauses for a moment and then slams his fist against the wall in frustration. He has lost nine overseers to Calvin Lucian and his kill squad team. They have been somehow overcoming the odds each time, and eliminating each overseer they track down. It wasn't supposed to end this way. Aaron Siegel vows to kill them all. Calvin Lucian, meanwhile, sits on a private jet with Adam and Olivia. He had just hung up the phone after a conversation with O5-4. The Overseer known as the Ambassador wants to surrender to the Insurgency. There's a good chance this is a trap, but Calvin has decided to meet with the Ambassador all the same. Calvin drops off Adam and Olivia at an Insurgency base. They still haven't fully recovered from the previous mission with O5-5, known as the Blackbird. Before leaving, though, Calvin meets with an Insurgency agent named Sylvester Sloan, who is going to join him as support. Calvin says goodbye to Adam and Olivia, then leaves with Sloan to meet the Ambassador in South Africa. After landing at Johannesburg Airport, Calvin and Sloan disembark and are led to a conference room where the Ambassador sits waiting for them. Calvin and Sloan sit across from O5-4 to discuss his surrender. The Council is in shambles, says the Ambassador. Everything is falling apart. I want to offer my services and information to the Insurgency in exchange for protection from O5-1. He has lost his mind. Calvin agrees to the terms and prepares for extraction. But as they get up from the table, gunshots can be heard from down the hall. The ambassador's eyes open wide in terror. It's too late, he whispers. Calvin and Sloan grab the ambassador, who is frozen in fear, and exit the conference room. They make their way towards their plane, but the gunshots are getting closer. Calvin looks over his shoulder to see Samsara pursuing them through the terminal. Calvin shoves the ambassador behind a table as bullets whiz overhead. Calvin and Sloan return fire, but their volley doesn't seem to slow down the assassins. Calvin and Sloan pull the ambassador to his feet 
and they burst through an emergency exit onto the sun-baked tarmac, where they make a mad dash for the plane. From behind them, a bullet rips through the chest of Sloan. The red right hand has caught up, but Calvin continues to drag the ambassador towards the plane. They are almost there. Suddenly, a metallic child's voice blares through the airport's external speakers. The child's voice says, I want Calvin Lucien alive. I have business to settle with him. The red right hand soldiers tackle Calvin and the ambassador to the ground when they are just feet away from the plane. Kill the traitor, the child's voice says, and Calvin can only watch helplessly as the ambassador is violently murdered. One of the agents turns towards Calvin and slams his fist into Calvin's face, causing him to black out. Calvin awakes in a dark room. He is unsure how much time has passed. The only light in the room comes from a screen on the wall. In the middle of the screen is a rotating red SCP Foundation seal. A voice from a speaker speaks. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is The Kid. I am the third overseer. You have killed all my friends and now I will kill all of yours. The door to the room opens. Calvin leans through the doorway. There is a long, dimly lit hallway. The kid orders him to proceed so they can meet face to face. As Calvin walks, the kid's voice echoes down the hallway. There once was another 05-3. He built incredible machines, even one that could see into the future. But unfortunately for him, he did not have the passion required to be an overseer. That was when I was... Born. I was chosen by the other overseers to have my spinal cord severed in a way that gave me the ability of the all-seeing eye. I now watch everything, all of the time. I have perfect reasoning, perfect awareness, and perfect understanding. Calvin gets to the end of the corridor, which opens up into a large chamber. Tied up in the middle of the room are Olivia and Adam. Calvin runs to his friends and crouches down next to them. A mechanical suit stands on a platform looking down at Calvin, Olivia, and Adam. Calvin realizes the kid must be contained inside. I now sentence you all to death, the mechanical suit says as the red right hand steps out of the shadows and slowly walks towards the remaining members of the kill squad. Suddenly, there is a flash of light and the Black Queen appears. Stop! What are you doing? shrieks the kid. The Black Queen hands Calvin the interdimensional rod and reel he used to defeat the Blackbird. Calvin casts the rod. From out of the terror in space comes a massive, multi-armed creature known as Maladramigion. The red right hand engages the monster, trying to force it back into its dimension, but the monster is too powerful. It grabs the cyborg clones and pulls them through the terror in reality. As Samsara battles the Maladramigion, Calvin frees Olivia and Adam. They make a run for the door. But as they flee, one of the walls opens up to reveal a turret. The gun fires, and a bullet hits Olivia directly in the head, killing her instantly. No! yells Calvin. Before Calvin can push Adam out of the way, a second bullet from the turret lodges itself in Adam's back. Calvin and Adam slide across the floor. The kid in his mechanical suit jumps down from the platform above. I am going to kill you now, Calvin Lucian, he says in his mechanical voice. There is another flash of light. Calvin watches in front of him as the Spear of the Non-Believer manifests itself before his eyes. Calvin grabs the spear and shoves it into the kid's machine body. It easily penetrates the armor and pins him to the wall. Calvin walks up to the exoskeleton and tears off the outer plating, revealing a tank full of fluid within which floats a malformed human fetus. As Calvin finally looks upon the kid's true form, he hears the sound of mocking mechanical laughter. Calvin breaks the glass and crushes the kid with his bare hands. As Calvin turns from the now silent robotic body of the kid, the room begins to shake, debris raining down from above. Calvin helps Adam up and puts Olivia's lifeless body across his shoulders. What remains of the kill squad makes their way out of the kid's lair. Outside of the foundation site where they were being held, Calvin helps Adam lie down on the ground before gently setting Olivia's body next to him. Adam grimaces as blood pours out of the wound in his back. Calvin reaches into his pocket and pulls out the vial of water from the Fountain of Youth. There are only a couple of drops left, which he pours into Adam's mouth. Adam looks up at Calvin, tears filling his eyes. He whispers, I love you, before he passes out from the pain. The wound in his back begins to heal instantly, and Calvin calls an insurgency evac team to come pick up Adam. With Adam safe, 
Calvin picks up Olivia and walks alone towards a truck in the lot outside of the Foundation site. He needs to finish this once and for all. He will kill the last two Overseers, or he will die trying. 05-1 Aaron Siegel arrives at where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, the Garden of Eden. He is in a frenzy due to the assassinations of all the other overseers besides himself and the Nazarene, and nothing will stop him. As he approaches the gate to the Garden of Eden, though, he is stopped by the Guardian of the Garden, a massive, powerful, anomalous entity with a flaming sword. But Aaron Siegel has no time or patience for anything to get in his way, even something as powerful as the Gate Guardian. The Guardian swings his burning sword at Adam, who rolls out of the way and, in a flash, takes out a Scranton reality anchor. He slams the anchor into the ground, which causes the world to shimmer and ripple around him. He watches as the flames from the Gate Guardian sword seem to absorb back into its body before it shrinks down, looking to fold in on itself until all that is left is a charred skeleton. With the Guardian defeated, Eren sprints into the garden. He searches the garden for 05-2, but can't find her anywhere. He finally comes to the Tree of Life, and that's where he finds her. Laying at the base of the tree in a pool of blood is the Nazarene. She has taken her own life. This is her anomalous power, though. She has died many times before, yet death always spared her and brought her back but somehow he knows this time is final. Aaron drops to his knees and screams in frustration. For all the power Aaron Siegel possesses, there's nothing he can do now. He sits next to the Nazarene's body for hours, hoping that she might wake up, or that he will, to find that this was all a dream. After sitting next to her cold body for some time, he notices something in her snowy white hand. It's a note, in it, the Nazarene explains that she was the one who gave the vials from the fountain to Calvin Lucian, and that she is the one who made the spear appear before him that he used to kill the kid. She explained that while she died many times and death always brought her back, each time she felt less and less like herself, less and less like Dr. Sophia Light. She hoped that maybe if things ended up like this, it would give Aaron the chance to walk away and live the life that they might have been able to have together. But she knows deep down that Aaron's fate is to meet Calvin and finish things once and for all. Aaron Siegel screams in rage, clutching the node in his hand. He tries to summon death, but no one comes. Aaron Siegel is alone. He stands up and walks deeper into the garden. He walks until he reaches a spot where even God's light does not reach. In this desolate land is an impact crater, where Lucifer, star of the morning, had fallen. In the middle of the crater lies Lucifer's sword. Aaron Siegel descends into the hole and picks up the sword. He turns and exits the Garden of Eden. Aaron Siegel has only one mission in life now, to kill Calvin Lucian. Calvin reads the final entry of the journal. In it, the author warns that although he hopes the information contained within the journal is helpful, he hopes the reader does not try to use it. The words written on the final page are, this information will only lead you to a devastating end. Calvin closes the journal and looks up at the structure in front of him. He has made it to Site-01. He had left Olivia's body in a cave nearby, promising to her that he would make this right. He now walks up to the massive doors and places his hand on the knotted wood. The doors slowly creak open. Calvin pauses for a moment and looks behind him at the setting sun. He enters Site-01, where he knows 05-1 is, where Aaron Siegel waits. Inside the main hall, Calvin sees a giant doorway in the shape of the SCP Foundation seal, with artistic depictions of certain SCPs that he instinctively knows are special in some way. Standing next to the doorway is a two-meter tall man in what looks to be a futuristic suit. Calvin approaches and asks who this giant man is. He responds that his name is Purpose, the Red Right Hand. He is the guardian of 05-1, and none shall enter the sanctum until he returns. He isn't here? asks Calvin. No, Purpose responds. He is. And with that, he steps aside and lets Calvin pass through the doorway. The doorway leads into a large room, where screens on the wall flash to life depicting moments from Calvin's journey 
documenting his entire quest. Had he been in control at all? Or was this all a setup to lead him to this moment? As he walks forward, he finally sees him. Sitting at a table in the middle of the room is Aaron Siegel. Euro 5-1, Calvin asks. Aaron, the man responds. My name is Aaron. Calvin asks about the location of the second overseer, the Nazarene, but 05-1 doesn't respond. Without needing any more information, Calvin pulls out his sidearm and in a flash fires off five shots. The bullet stopped in the air, inches from Aaron, before mm -hmm. dissolving in a flash of light. Calvin should have known it wouldn't be this easy. Stand up, Aaron Siegel! Calvin calls up as he holsters his gun. Let's finish it! Calvin pulled the spear of the non-believer from his back, but Aaron's only response was to laugh. <laughs> you don't even know why you're here, Aaron said. Calvin calls back, I'm here to kill you, because when I do, I kill the Foundation. Because when you're gone, the universe can finally heal. You're like me, Calvin Lucian. We are both men driven by our own convictions, regardless of the outcome. It would seem fate has brought us together. Now either your convictions will be broken or you will die, says Aaron Siegel. He then draws Lucifer's flaming sword and lunges towards Calvin Lucian. As the two men clash with one another, their supernatural weapons begin to destroy the room around them. Furniture is shattered, video screens are obliterated, and fire spreads across the walls. Aaron catches Calvin off balance and swings the flaming sword across Calvin's stomach. Calvin slides back from the impact, hunching over from the pain in his midsection. He brings his head up to see Aaron Siegel running towards him with the flaming sword high in the air. Calvin brings up the spear. From his knees, he leans back and launches it towards Aaron Siegel. The spear enters the final overseer's chest, the force from the throw pinning him against the wall. Aaron Siegel drops Lucifer's sword. It shatters as it hits the ground. He clutches the shaft of the spear protruding from his sternum with both hands. 05-1 looks at Calvin unbelievingly. <coughs> you have no idea what you've done. It was never about the Overseers, Aaron Siegel says, spitting out blood with every word. It was something deeper, something worse. Calvin walks slowly towards Aaron Siegel. He stops just in front of his final enemy. This is the way it ends, Calvin says. Aaron Siegel manages to whisper one final word. Sophia before his body finally goes limp. Calvin turns to see Purpose standing behind him. He's dead, Calvin says, half to Purpose and half to himself. I killed him. After a moment, he asks Purpose what he really wants to know. There's a room in this facility where someone could unmake the foundation, right? Take me there. Without any hesitation, Purpose leads Calvin back to the room with depictions of important SCPs. There, Purpose opens the door to an elevator but stops Calvin before he can get inside. I am duty bound to tell you, Purpose says, that once you step inside this elevator, there is no going back. There is only one decision to be made, and it is not one that can be unmade. I know, Calvin responds. It's time before stepping inside. The elevator opens a door to reveal a room filled with bookcases and a huge window offering a beautiful view of the sun setting behind the mountains. On the wall are monitors depicting the ways he had killed all of the overseers, and in the middle of the room is a large desk with a computer. Calvin sits down at the desk and the computer comes to life. The computer prompts him to scan his fingerprint, which it accepts. He's logged in. The computer screen displays numerous locations around the planet, and he quickly recognizes that they are all SCP Foundation sites. Then he sees the single option the computer is giving him, terminate. Calvin reaches out with his finger. This is it. Once he presses this button, the SCP Foundation will be no more. His finger is millimeters from the button when the phone rings. Calvin hadn't even noticed that there was a phone on the desk. Calvin stares at it for a moment, then picks it up. Hello, he says. The voice on the other line responds. Hello, Calvin Lucian. My name is the Administrator. I've been following your work for some time now, and I must say I am impressed. 
I have just been informed that you have completed your mission. Congratulations are in order. What the hell are you talking about? Calvin asks. Please listen, says the voice on the other line. The man you just killed was once in the same exact position you are in now. Granted, it was a very long time ago, but Aaron Siegel originally was trying to destroy the Foundation. That was until I convinced him otherwise. And now, like Aaron Siegel, you will become the new head of the Foundation. Like hell I will, yells Calvin. I could hang up and walk away right now and be done with all this. You could, continues the administrator. But if no one is in charge of the SCP Foundation, millions of people will die, if not billions, and then nobody would be there to manage what comes after. There is silence from Calvin. That's what I thought, says the administrator. I look forward to working with you, Calvin Lucian. Or should I say, 05-1, the line goes dead. The Ouroboros Cycle, one of the biggest, most legendary series of entries in the history of the SCP Foundation. We've covered the events of this SCP-001 epic in six videos, which we definitely recommend you watch before this one to avoid your brain exploding from the sheer scope of it all. Because that's the thing about the Ouroboros Cycle. It's a story so big, sprawling, and dense that it can feel almost like an anomaly itself. Whether you're immersed in the possible origin of the Broken God, the sentient black hole that can destroy the whole universe, or Calvin Lucian's quest to assassinate the O5 Council, it can sometimes be difficult to see the forest from the trees. But worry not, because that's exactly why we're here today. We're going to step back and look at this anomalous odyssey as a whole and ask the big question, why is it all here together? What makes these four different storylines, the children, the broken god, atonement, and the way it ends one big cycle? As with anything involving the SCP Foundation, there's always going to be an element of personal interpretation. But now that we've gone through the whole cycle, we think it's worth adding our two cents to the proceedings. So let's start broad. A question you've probably been wondering is, what do the words Orboros Cycle actually mean? And what is their significance to the four stories within? While the spelling can differ, Orboros refers to the ancient symbol of a snake or dragon eating its own tail, forming a circle a direct connection to the concept of cycles. The Arboros symbol has existed in a huge number of cultures, from the ancient Egyptians to the ancient Greeks to modern Gnostic traditions. It's often used in alchemy or other magical practices and has a variety of meanings such as eternal life, the endless cycle of death and rebirth, and the cycle of renewal. Anyone familiar with the tales within the Arboros cycle is probably already noticing some similarities. Cycles are a common theme in all of these works. People endlessly repeat mistakes, threats thought to be contained or destroyed return, and oftentimes, those who go out on a quest to destroy something end up becoming what they wish to destroy in the first place. In a cycle, there is no true end and no true beginning. Everything repeats endlessly. But let's start at the closest thing to the beginning we have, the children. In this tale, the Foundation faces off against a terrifying reality-warping group of interests known as the Kingdom of Abaddon. This nasty group which came from the Sahara Desert could seemingly take anything the Foundation threw at them, and were able to straight-up vaporize anyone who got too close. If the Kingdom was able to amass enough power, it could spell the end of the Foundation, and even the subjugation of the human race. Enter 05-1, a reoccurring character in the Ouroboros Cycle. This outside-the-box thinker put all his chips on the Twins of God project, designated SCP-001, like many anomalies before and after it. This project would infuse a human being with godlike powers, but it was a power so great that it seemed to kill anyone who attempted to accept it. Needless to say, this was a major bummer for 05-1. But through relentless human experimentation, even sacrificing the population of entire towns to the project, he eventually came up with a solution. A horrifying solution, but a solution nonetheless. He found that a group of nine children, with ages varying from 4 to 11, could act as a human conduit for 001's power. And as a result, it could be a weapon capable of turning the tide against the Kingdom of Abaddon. During the testing phase, though, it seemed like O5-1 went a little mad with power. He vaporized an entire church of the Broken God Place of Worship, 
and used the power of the children to wipe a few others off the map at his own discretion. His abuses of power got so flagrant that the administrator himself was called in to get a handle on the situation. And surprise, surprise, 05-1 disintegrated him too, before disappearing himself shortly afterwards. In the end, the children were deemed too dangerous to be practical, both because of their anomalous powers and from the level of ambient radiation they put out. All nine were locked in radiation-proof boxes and buried in the desert, though they each show signs of life to this day. While this may seem disconnected from the rest of the series, it actually establishes some of the most important reoccurring themes and ideas of the cycle as a whole, namely the Foundation messing with reality and performing horrific acts to achieve their goals, the corruption of the O5 Council, and the fact that these grand attempts to change or save the world often blow up in everyone's faces, sometimes literally. We also have the introduction and apparent death of the mysterious administrator. But trust us, all is not what it seems with this one. The ripple effect beginning here will affect everything going forward. Next, the Broken God. This tells the chaotic story of a magical clockwork box which is worshipped by the Church of the Broken God as a conduit to their deity, and eventually becomes an all-devouring mechanical kaiju. The beast, soon dubbed SCP-001, devoured and consumed all the metal around it, slowly becoming larger and more destructive. If the Foundation didn't take it out before it reached critical mass, they'd be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a bona fide god, a fight they really weren't sure they could win. Thankfully, and with a little anomalous help from SCP-2399, the Foundation was able to destroy the anomaly. They removed its clockwork heart from the wreckage and contained the anomalous scrap that once comprised its destructive body. However, the Foundation soon realized that you just can't keep a good god down. The clockwork heart eventually evaded Foundation containment while being shipped to a secondary location and instead ended up in a small town. Here it began to influence the minds of the residents into more subservient broken god cultists, intent on building him back up to his former glory. It'd be easy to discount the broken god as an outlier, seeing as the Foundation came out looking much better here than they do in any of the other Orboros tales. But when you look carefully, its place in the overall cycle is clear. The entry ends the way it begins, with the heart of the broken god influencing humans to carry out its bidding. The Foundation had to intervene in between these two instances, but in the end, there was no net loss to the Broken God itself. In a sense, the Foundation is doomed to encounter the same problems again and again, continually defending the world from the same anomalous threats. And the Foundation needs to succeed every time to maintain peace and normality. A major anomalous threat only needs to succeed once to drag everything into disarray. In many ways, that is the curse of the SCP Foundation. Speaking of major anomalous threats, now it's time for part three of the Ouroboros cycle, Atonement. Once again, we start off with the Foundation meddling with cosmic scale powers with the creation of the Area 11 Pietrical Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array. Try saying that three times fast. That was a machine so powerful, it was capable of creating a singularity though what it actually ended up doing was turning Dr. Calvin Desmet into an abomination. More specifically, into a kind of immensely powerful humanoid black hole, whose powers were only restrained by the very machine that created him. Think of him as kind of a malicious Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. This new entity, dubbed SCP-001, presented a grim prophecy and an ominous offer. He told the O5 Council that anomalies were leaking into their universe from other realities, and soon the anomalous threat would destroy them all. His offer was to, upon his release, wipe out the rest of the multiverse entirely, leaving only our reality free from anomalous threats. Unsurprisingly, it was O5-1 that was most interested in this offer, so much so that he held a vote and murdered everyone who voted against the decision to release SCP-001. Having built his consensus among the survivors on the Council, O5-1 let SCP-001 out. Unsurprisingly, this turned out to be a terrible decision, as one of his first acts upon being freed was to kill the members of the O5 Council that had just voted to release 001, saying that they themselves were anomalous and needed to be purged to atone for their past sins. The only survivor was a member of the Council who abstained from the vote, who was able to recontain SCP-001 inside the Pietrical Fontaine Array, for now. 
Once again, the thematic connections to the rest of the Ouroboros cycle is clear. We have a world-ending anomaly held off, but only temporarily, buying time before the cycle inevitably continues. We have the Foundation abusing its power and signing off on the death of countless people in other dimensions. And, of course, the O5 Council stepped out of their bounds and actively warped reality, just like they had with the children before. Their chickens truly come home to roost, though, in the final part of the cycle. Appropriately named The Way It Ends, this piece chronicles the story of Calvin Lucian and the Kill Squad, an elite group of four Chaos Insurgency soldiers with one goal, assassinating the entire O5 Council, 13 of the most powerful people in the world. Why? Because they've been messing with reality itself time and time again, and it's getting to the point that their selfish meddling could finally destroy everything. And given that we've already seen it happen with the children and the entity that Dr. Calvin Desmet became, it's hard to disagree with them. What follows is one of the longest and most complicated tales in all of the Foundation, as the Kill Squad systematically encounters and kills each insane, anomalous member of the O5 Council. In order to do this, they need to make deals with death itself, fight giant serpents, cross dimensions, deal with SCP-610 and SCP-682 containment breaches, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Samsara, arguably the Foundation's deadliest mobile task force. A number of other insane things happen along the way, like O5-1 murdering the Gate Guardian with the Scranton Reality Anchor, and the Black Queen, the most prominent member of the Serpent's Hand helping our heroes defeat more overseers. In the end, Calvin Lucian, despite losing almost everything, reigns victorious in the final battle. Using the Spear of the Non-Believer, a weapon so powerful it can kill gods, Calvin managed to finally kill the top member of the Overseers, O5-1. With the O5 Council destroyed, Calvin set about completing his final task, destroying the entire SCP Foundation. But that didn't happen. Instead, he was contacted by a mysterious and immensely powerful being known as the Administrator, who gave him some frightening news. He'd just been hired by the SCP Foundation to be their new O5-1. This was where our last video on the Arboros series left us. What happens next, you may ask? How does Calvin respond to this offer he seemingly can't refuse? In this case, it seems that the administrator, of being so completely tied to the nature of the Foundation itself, is SCP-001. And while it seemed that the Overseers were mad with power, they were actually always there to keep the Administrator in check. Aaron Siegler, the O5-1 that Calvin had just killed, was doing the exact same thing Calvin was doing when he became O5-1, trying to destroy the Foundation. But the Foundation and the Administrator cannot be beaten, they can only be joined. And that's exactly what Calvin did, becoming the new O5-1, turning his back on the Chaos Insurgency, and rebuilding the rest of the Council and the Foundation in his own image. Insurgency members who were once his allies vowed revenge for this betrayal, perhaps suggesting that history would go on to repeat itself once more in the future. Because at the end of the day, that's what the Ouroboros cycle really is. The reoccurring threat and the changing of the guards that accompanies it. There will always be a Foundation. There will always be an Administrator. There will always be an O5 Council. Nothing starts, nothing ends. All that ever changes are the names and faces involved. Whether it's Calvin Lucian or Aaron Siegler, the wheel keeps turning. The snake devours its own tail. The Ouroboros cycle is, and forever will be, eternal. Now go check out our full piece-by-piece -piece breakdown on the Ouroboros cycle starting with SCP-001 The Children, and then check out SCP-5000Y The Full Story Compilation just in case we haven't blown your mind enough for one day.